So we're going to start off behind the scenes. So anyways, everybody, I apologize for um, the late start in the show. And I'm still like not quite fully ready for the show yet, but it is already four minutes after two o'clock. So you're going to you're going to hear and see live some behind the scenes stuff because I'm still getting ready. But, you know, the old saying the the show must go on right and um because coco right so we can't miss a coco talk i believe we have an obligation we have a moral obligation to um <laughs> to have our it's a moral to, imperative a moral imperative that's that's awesome yes so yeah i'm still getting ready i do apologize let me see if my does somebody just fart by the way or is that just uh so here goes david <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if the sound is working right now. He was letting you know his opinion of starting late. <laughs> Don't even start with me. I do have a bucket over here. David has been <laughs> under the weather. I need to get the uh, live stream open so I can see if somebody's even watching us right now. So give me, give me two seconds to work on that. Uh, <laughs> anywho, uh, this is episode 26. Today is uh, September the 16th, I believe. Uh, and the year of 2017 of our Lord. And let's see if the live stream is live. And let's see if anybody's here. Okay, Death Dog Gaming number eight is here. He says you should be okay. Okay, so yeah, it looks like we are now live. We'll do it live. Yes, so um, we're live. We're here. I am still getting ready. But let's address who's, uh, who's in the call real quick here, too. Let me move that crap over so I can, again, so I can see what the heck I'm doing here. This is, you know, it doesn't get any better than this when it comes to a professional broadcast. You know what I mean? So on right. the call with us right now, why is my freaking... Oh, I know why. I know why, I think. Um, I need to reopen my Google Chrome and, and open it as me. I, I, I'm starting to feel like David Ladd. I've got more than one personality. Um, and when I open up Chrome... This starts at 3 o'clock. What starts at 3 o'clock? All right, so we're two minutes in. Uh, Michael Newman is here. Richard Cavell is here. Says, hi, I'm logged in via YouTube. Thank you, Richard, for being here. Um, and, yeah, so today is September the 16th. This is Coco Talk, episode 26. I can now see my live stream. My live stream is on the screen. Uh, I know there are things that we do need to talk about today. I don't even remember what all those things were. That's okay. We'll get to them. No hurries, no worries. I think Facebook was one of the things that we needed to talk about. Uh, everything else. But anyway, so let me acknowledge who's in the uh, show right now. So we have Karen Enscom with us. We have Paul Thayer, Curtis Boyle, Grant Leedy, Glenn Hewlett, David Ladd, Richard Lorbieski, and Mark Overholzer. At the moment, I'm your host, the original <coughs> Stevie Stroh, the host with the most. And um, we're here for Coco Talk Live, and I'm still getting ready, so bear with me. It is... Um, yeah, it's been a crazy week for me recovering from Hurricane Irma. We we suffer. We didn't suffer necessarily, so I'd say we um, made out well. Um, lost power for 24 hours, and that was really about it. But no damage, no flooding. So we did much better than a lot of other parts of the state of Florida did. So I'm thankful for that. But my biggest challenge this week has been that um, all of my customers have needed a lot of my help. So work-wise, I've been on overdrive and it's not giving me a lot of time to prepare for other YouTube type things this week. So way behind schedule. Ron Delvo is calling in right now. Ho ho Ron Delvo, how are you? Hello. Welcome to Cobra Talk, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. Um there are plugins on my screen that are just way screwed up right now. There's a lot of things on um on my broadcast right now that are just like weird things have changed the way YouTube did the live chat that has changed so there's a lot of weird crap that I'm discovering now because I'm, I'm starting late uh, what else do I want to do Facebook saved I have some things there um, just getting everything ready to talk about yes yeah, Simon Jonathan's got a new demo coming up which is really cool so I wanted to show that off too uh, let me get back to oh man. And YouTube keeps changing stuff. Every time I go to pull up things on YouTube, that freaking stuff changes, and that drives me crazy. I'm just like, holy crap. Okay, my channel. Uh, I just like to get a few things queued up so I got things to talk about. Okay, edit layout. Ron Delvo has Sockmaster's uh, Boink demo running in the background there. That's looking pretty good. 
and here we go and we're gonna go to video manager so I have these guys ready to look at so we can talk about what type of videos were viewed and who left comments and all that kind of crap I think I've got that ready Simon Jonason is calling in all right Simon Jonason is here with us hello Simon all right so I think we're I think we're just about good to go at this point so, uh, hello everybody. I think we're now ready officially to start, to start Coco Talk episode 25. Although there is something else weird going on right now with uh, Glenn's, Glenn's assembly optimization should be spoken about, Curtis is saying too. You could just speak. Use your words, Curtis. This is a talk show, so we can talk. Uh, I was just on the phone with the customer, so I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear right. me? Can I hear who? Ron Delvo. Rondelzo, oh, yes, we can me? hear you. Okay, great. Yes. Last time, my uh, other computer that I usually am on uh, is updating all of a sudden. So. so. Okay. Blame Microsoft. Okay. Maybe this will work better. Even if it's a Mac, blame Microsoft. Uh, yeah. all right. I hear lots of good background noise now. All right. So, yeah, I'm trying to fix the chat. The chat looks like crap. I can't see the chat and the thing. Retro Innovations is here. Uh, me is recording my name in the YouTube. Okay, so that's 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 uh, Jim Brain from Retro Innovations. Thanks for stopping by, guys. Sorry, this is still technically all, even though we're live, this is still all behind the scenes because I'm getting a late start today and, and uh, the world is just cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs right now, I must say. So um, here we are. So why don't we do this now? Why don't we start off with the national anthem and then our official intro? And now we will officially start uh, Coco Talk. So hold on one second. Let's try that again. These things are not set to some of these things are not set to loop. This is Coco Talk. The nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. With your host, Mr. Gameplay Goodness himself, Stevie Strout. All right, well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Coco Talk episode 26. Or as like, we like to call this one the uh, Fluster Cluck episode. So, yeah, I got my act together here. Like, it's nobody's business. And I just realized, too, the live stream still says live streaming Hurricane Irma from my backyard. So I think I need to fix that, too. Yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is Coco Talk <laughs> episode 26. And, um, you know... What are we going to tell you? So we're in Coco Talk, right? So Coco Talk is the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. I am your host, uh, the original gamer, Stevie Stroh, and I am joined by Karen Anscombe and Curtis Boyle and Glenn Hewlett and Richard Lorbieski and Ron Del Vaux and Paul Thayer and Grant Leedy and David Ladd and Mark Overholzer and... All the way from the UK, the madman himself, Simon Jonasson. Uh, we're all here. Well, Karen's from the UK as well. Actually, Denmark. I said the UK. It's Denmark. This is showing you how screwed up uh, my head is right now. Yes. So all the way well, from Denmark. Well, originally from the UK. So originally from the UK, but live from Denmark. Welcome, Simon. I was just mentioning before you joined us that you've got some cool new demos Um that you've been putting up on YouTube as well, which we hope to look at. So yeah, we are in episode 26 of Coco Talk, and um, what are we going to talk about today? I don't know, the Coco maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, your laundry list are pretty good. Say that again. Your laundry list sounded pretty good. Yeah. Well, let me do this real quick too. Let me hold something up to the screen for everybody to see. What I'm holding up here now in in large glory is a mug 
that says Coco Talk with the new Coco Talk logo. This should have been here last week, but mail was delayed because of Hurricane Irma. This was supposed to be here last week. I could have showed off on the show. But here it is. This is the new travel mug with the new Coco Talk Deluxe logo, which matches the podcast and the website now. And I actually, I, I like this mug better than I expected to like it because when I, when I saw it on the website, I thought it was made out of plastic. It's actually made out of metal. And it's um it's two layers, so it's like it's got like the inner layer, so whatever you have stays hot or cold, and then there's an outer layer, so when you touch it, it's not as warm to the touch. So like right now I'm drinking some hot tea, and it's and it's not very warm on the outside, but it's hot on the inside. So the mug is a very cool mug. So I just got that, and let me show you what else that I happen to be wearing right now. Did you get yours, Mark? Yep, I do. The new Coco Talk T-shirt, the Coco Talk. I uh, look at Mark right there. Yeah. Well, nobody else can see you, so I'll put you back in just a second. So here's my Coco Talk Deluxe T-shirt. This is the one that features the um, the uh, the fancier logo. So let's let's put Mark up real big. Yes, yeah, so Mark's wearing his shirt there too. Uh, that looks good in royal blue, Mark. I know you mentioned you like that color. Yeah, it looks good on you. Uh, brings out your eyes. And, uh, and you can see the little TV bezel around the Coco Talk too, which doesn't show up as well on a darker shirt. So yeah, now that looks really cool. So yeah, the deluxe swag is here and I'm liking it. And so this is my first time um, wearing the shirt. I'm wearing it for today and it looks really cool. So that was kind of a new thing. I've been busy this week with uh, Hurricane Irma and um, uh, because I do IT for a living, a lot of my customers have um, needed my help. I've had people without power. I've had you know all kinds of technical issues to deal with. So it's been a fun and exciting week for me, uh, keeping me really busy and not giving me enough time to really prepare for today's show. So anyways, we're here. So who else is in the live chat right now? So um, going back to the, the live chat, Death Dog. 08 was here. Michael Newman is here. Richard Cavell is here. Lego versus Minecraft says hello. Uh, Lego versus Minecraft is here. Um, uh, Curtis Boyle says I'm ordering my mug in October. And then Michael Newman says I think I will be ordering both as well. Very cool. Yeah. So um, it's good stuff. And I like it. And it's this is different than my usual shirt that I wear that says original gamer. So it's just kind of cool. So, uh, so yeah, you've heard enough about me complaining about my week. How's everybody else's week been? And has anybody done anything kind of cool or interesting that you want to share that other people and fans of retro might find interesting to hear about? I found more stuff in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> How big is this garage, Rondelvo? <laughs> well, Starting to sound like I'll show you some stuff. Yeah. Um, you want me to go ahead and switch over to your video right now, or are you going to wait for the Ron's Garage segment? Wait for the wait segment. For the sec okay. okay. I'm hearing a little bit of an echo, so I'm not sure who's got me coming through their speakers right now. Maybe me. Okay. Who else has got? Who else had any any anything cool go on this week that uh, is of interest to retro? Uh, I'm going to be releasing my video cables on Monday. The SCART to or the H. Uh, what is it? The uh, Coco to SCART to HDMI cables. Uh, I'm going to have those released on Monday. Okay. And I'm going to be selling them for $24 uh, directly. Uh, if you want to get them on eBay, they're going to be 30 because eBay charges a lot more money. Hmm. Excellent. You'll have to post the link to that. Yes. Man, YouTube has really screwed up the way this live chat looks in the live feed right now. It's really screwing with things. I don't have an easy way to show the live chat the way I want to see it. I'm going to have to figure that out later on. But obviously, it's kind of difficult to work with. Um, while we're live yeah uh so bruce moore who's not here is a recipient of one of your scart to um uh, hdmi cables or rgb to scart cable i guess you could say and that gets then converted to hdmi uh you got me thinking about possibly wanting to get one too so if you have some available at tandy assembly i might want to take one off your hands oh yeah i'll, I'll definitely have uh, uh many of them available there so uh, yeah and and i'm also going to have the uh, rgb uh to uh vga cables as well uh so if you want to hook up directly to a vga multi-sync monitor that supports a 15 kilohertz signal uh you can get those as well okay and is that a completely passive cable no uh no electricity involved to make that right it's completely passive that's pretty yeah. cool 
Yeah, it, it's it actually will go directly to a uh, uh, VGA cable. Does does your SCART cable have any timing differences that are affected between the eighty six and the eighty seven Gimme, or would it work on any Coco three? It should work on any Coco three. Okay, because one of the challenges that I had with Ed Snyder's um, RGB to S video um, prototype board he sent me was that it was based on the timing of the eighty. 80- seven gimme and so the one the, you know when he sent it to me i couldn't even use it until i was able to swap my gimme out right yeah the only the only uh requirements that you're going to need is of course is an hdmi cable uh i do sell the converters but uh i sell more i i the, the ones i that i sell are the I, I mean i sell them at a higher price because i don't get any kind of price break but uh right. there there are links that you, you can get them almost, almost anywhere um i also the, the, the power that I have mined, because uh, you also need a one volt uh, input uh, to the signal, I have a, a USB connector on mine to, you can hook it up to any USB powered device or even a USB port. So you would need something like that. Okay. And you can get those for a couple of dollars or you can just use an existing uh, USB port. Okay. Cool. Well, we definitely look forward to seeing you at Tandy Assembly, meeting you in person. I can't believe how close it is. Speaking of Tandy Assembly, I finally booked my rental car to uh, to do my epic road trip carpool adventure. <laughs> so I got the I got the rental car booked. Uh, cool. Uh, who else? We know we know Simon's been busy. We've seen some of Simon's mad work. So hopefully we'll show some of that off today. Ron's got a bunch of stuff in his garage that he's dug up, which we'll look at today. Anybody else do any fun projects this week, or read anything, or do anything? Hear about anything you want to share with us? Steve, I've been super busy the last couple of days um, uploading the optimizing the sixty eight oh nine assembly code. Ah, series. yes, your blogs, yes. Yeah, so that's been. I I didn't think it would be. Uh, such a rush like i started i you know i've been taking notes for a, for the last six months or whatever and just keeping them to myself and kind of put them together in the past and i decided okay it's time to put some of these together in the blog and then i started then i was starting to get some um ideas from other people about optimizing the code so i go i better <laughs> maybe post everything i have so that people can see what i'm missing and then i can just add to it because uh I didn't want to, you know, put up, well, I, I have part one and two now, but, you know, um, I might get suggestions for what I'm going to write on my third part before I even finish it. So I think it's better if I get it all up as soon as I can, and then anybody who has anything to add, I can just add it rather than, you know, doing like a double take on some of the stuff I'm about to write anyway. Right, right, right. No, I mean, I think that's really great that you're sharing that, and um, I, I know I, I haven't started this journey yet but when i do i'm going to definitely use that as a resource and simon jonason's another one who's been sharing his code and optimizations with us um it's really great that there are people out there who um have some of this knowledge and experience and um are sharing it with other people and norlander just joined us in the live chat so hello norlander how are you yeah so thanks for doing that we'll try to pull up those blogs and and post a link to them as well i'll get them on my website uh, like I said, I've been a little bit behind the eight ball this week with all my helping all my customers uh, get back in business after losing power, and I, you know, had to move things to data centers and all kinds of fun stuff. So it's been a fun week. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, um, thank you for doing that. That's really cool. Yeah, no problem. Um, and um, you know, thanks for what you've done for all your uh, contributions to the, the color computer games with Pac Man and with everything else, and with your interviews with us and everything. So it's very cool. Very cool stuff. Um, I, because I've been so busy, I just got around today to editing last week's episode to upload for the podcast so people can listen to. So episode 25 from last week will be available to listen to later today. And just replaying that and hearing some of the stuff, um, uh, you know, there's a few things that we talked about last week too, like one of them being the retro pie or the cocoa pie, you know, which is something I want to do in the future. And I know that one kind of got a little, a little train wrecky because, you know, everything wasn't going quite as, <laughs> as smoothly as possible because I was trying to do things on the spot. That, that's the, 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 the every, every time I start this show, this was what goes through my mind. I go, every episode has the potential to be 
a huge train wreck, an incredible train wreck, you know? And it's just like, for the most part, we really haven't been because it's live, it's unscripted. We got people all over the world. We're on Skype. There's there's internet delays. There's technical difficulties. There's a million things. This is like the perfect storm for everything to go wrong. And very rarely has it done that. So, you know, knock on wood that <laughs> other than me trying to show something off that I wasn't really qualified to do, the show hasn't really sucked that bad. So <laughs> and, and most of it is thanks to all the people above me on the screen here, because if it was just up to me, yeah, it would be a huge train wreck. So, so thank you, everybody, for being here every week. Um, David, you've been sick this week, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More like so, the last two weeks. So. Yeah. Poor David. Every, everybody on the count of three, let's all go all. Okay. So one, two, three. Oh, oh. poor David sick. So. <laughs> you need somebody to tuck you in, David. You need a blankie. You need me to fluff your pillow for you. <laughs> wow. I got something that I can show you. <laughs> <laughs> fluff your pillow, yeah. I think his uh, Skype thing says he wants a dragon, isn't it? <laughs> uh, Richard Cavell is saying, is there a minimum or maximum length for each Coco talk? Uh, I would say no to both. There isn't a minimum length. Uh, and when it comes to maximum lengths, I think we've gone over three and a half hours on more than one occasion. I think one of the first times we did that is when Steve Bjork just, you know, randomly joined us and he was on a roll with his stories. And so it was like nobody wanted to stop listening. Um, and I don't remember when the other time was, but we've had at least two episodes that were getting into the four hour ballpark, you know. So um, is there a minimum length? I guess, you know, if we completely ran out of things to talk about, then, yeah, we might have a short show. I think the shortest shows, our first couple of shows were maybe hour and a half, and yeah. then we've been averaging two to two and a half hours. So I would say a two-hour show would technically be a short show for us at this point. Um, there's no shortage of, of, quali of quantity of talking, and, you know, the actual level of quality might vary from show to show. <laughs> Uh, floppy talk probably go, it goes down in history as probably one of the most uh, beneficial episodes we've ever had. So we can never forget episode 23, Floppy Talk. It's forever ingrained in the, in the annals of history. Is that a word? <laughs> Usually pronounced a lot of Steve. <laughs> Grant Leedy, how's your week been this week? It's been pretty good. I just... Uh been doing a lot of work and yeah, having some health problems, but other than that, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And Paul, we don't get to see or hear from you very often. How you doing, Paul Thayer? Hey, great. I've been I've been a busy boy on the cocoa. I just haven't really been uh, sharing a whole lot lately because I'm trying to make progress and prepare things before I, I don't know, I like to be prepared before I start uh, sharing stuff so that it's, you know, kind of fuller, I guess, and not fragmented. So, yeah, no, that's cool. Um, I was wondering how I find out what year my Color Computer 3 was uh, manufactured. I just, just thought about that two seconds ago. Does anybody mm -hmm. know how to figure that out? Ranged in the time or, or, or what? Just when it was actually made. Yeah, I'm wondering what year it was actually you know manufactured because you talk about different gimme chips and whatnot i'm wondering which one i have um and gimme, part of, sorry go ahead the gimme the, the gimme just look at the uh copy the, the, the gimme itself there is uh it's on the silk screening on the top of the chip there will be a date printed on there oh so i have to open it okay yeah you well, have what, to open actually it. no you can also there's some test programs you can use like sock has got some stuff that's specifically timed for each one and you can specify which one it is and if the demo works really wonky then you know you got the other one the reason that I ask is because with Timberman, I want to make sure that it's working for both. Um, I don't want to run into a problem where people can't play it for whatever reason on whatever system they're using, you know, whether it be an emulator or whatever. So that's one of the reasons why I was wondering, because I test on my real color computer all the time. But then I got thinking the other day, I was like, crap, what if I have this 86 or 87 gimme? You know, and it's not going to work the same for other people. So, there's a test program also on the uh, cook on the uh, 
Facebook group. I'm just looking here. There is. Cool. I can look that up and find that some other time. That's not a big deal. Yeah, I'm just yeah, the main difference between them is the timing. Um, if I remember correctly, the uh, fast timer uh, has a one cycle difference between the two. So okay. triggering a timer interrupt, it'll do it in two cycles on one and three on the other or something like that. That's going to make a difference because we're going to be using the FRIQ for, for music. Um, well, not music, sound effects. And Simon is going to teach me that. Hopefully, in the near future, he's a busy man right now, too, And uh, but he's always, always there to help out. If you guys are interested, I'd love to share my progress so far with the game, mm -hmm. uh, but if not, we can move on. I don't, I don't care either and, way. And, and how are you going to do that? Are you going to screen share? So we I can, can screen share, yeah, absolutely. Okay, sure. I would love to see that. Let me, uh, let me move the camera over. I'm trying to fix the on-screen chat so it looks a little bit better. YouTube has completely wonkified something for me. <laughs> um, so, yay, YouTube. Okay, so I've got your... Whenever you go to share your screen, we'll see you full screen. Here All right. Percent. Now i got to figure that out. I go into conversation, I think. Uh, just click on the little plus symbol, I think. Yeah, the plus. Share. Okay, Mark just put in the uh, YouTube chat the link to the gimme. Um... Wayne Campbell just joined us. Hey, Wayne, how are you? Yeah, you'll only be a member of the Coco Facebook group, TRS-80 Color Computer 1, but then you can access the file. You just yeah, download Paul, I believe Paul is. Yeah, I'm listening, to, I'm listening to him. Hello? Did I yeah. lose you guys? No, you're nope, here, Paul. we can hear you. Oh, <laughs> everything went, went really quiet for a second. Um, <laughs> so is my screen active right now? Mm, not, it's not being shared yet. Neg negative, Ghost Rider. All right, got to figure out why. I think that FIRQ with the gimmies is, the difference is only if you have like a timer of one. Yeah, But if it's the really it's, low end timer, the really yeah. fast one. But I believe if as long as you're like two or above, it won't matter which gimme you're using, it'll act the same. Yeah, it was like Sockmaster's demos where he's trying to change the power like a hundred times per scan line or something like that, that I think it was a problem. Right, really pushing it. What you like? <laughs> <laughs> I may have exaggerated for effect. <laughs> Some people have lofty goals. Okay, so we're seeing Paul full screen right now. Oh, all right, cool. Um, there are some uh, secrets in this game, but uh, that's all right. I'll let it. You can I'll share. You can share sound too. There's a little plus for that too. Uh, there is system. no. There is no sound yet. That has oh, there is uh, no sound. not been programmed yet. We have the samples uh, downloaded, and uh, Simon ki so kindly converted them for me. Uh, the next step is getting them in here. I have a lot of work to do anyway. Um, so you guys have all seen this probably where it scrolls in for the title screen. Yeah, that looks cool. So there are six unlockable characters in this game. Oh, that is cool, dude. So, <clears throat> the first one, you have to uh, just get a high score of 300. Okay. And the next one is you have to get a high score of 100 three times in a row. Okay. Uh, then 600 for your high score. Uh, 400. Uh, and I think it's, yep, yeah, 200 three times in a row for that character. And then the last character takes a total chop of 6809. Now, mm -hmm. is it? Um, are these characters completely cosmetic, or they have different abilities, or strengths, or speeds? It's cosmetic. Okay, so it's like a skin. <laughs> yep, it's just a cool skin change. Okay. Um, future projects that I wanted. This was kind of like a project that next door. was going to be kind of simple to get implemented, but mm -hmm. also had a lot of the features in it that I want for future projects, like. I really like one of the things I like about modern games is being able to like save progress and come back into them. Yes. Uh, and that's something that I'd like to add to some of the games that I want to make in the future. Um, and not just saving progress, but having like uh, trophies and, and certain things like that. So this game was kind of testing grounds for all that different stuff. Um, so if you're in the character selection screen and you don't, and you try to select an unlocked character, it's going to go back to whoever you had picked last. Okay. 
And then here's uh, what Glenn Hewlett called the teaser, and that's the play button. And just about ready to start chopping down the tree and start scoring some points. Okay. Um, but I'm running into some problems with the speed and uh, the health bar. So how the health bar works is that it's constantly depleting to the left. And the more you chop, the more, you, the more health you gain. But as the levels increase, your depletion rate increases. So you have to chop faster to stay alive. Um, and if you can't chop fast enough, you'll die. Oh, wow. So, <clears throat> yeah. If you've ever played the phone app, it works exactly the same way. And that's what okay. I'm using this on. So, okay. now, do, do you cap, tap the keyboard to do this? Or is this a joystick no, left and right thing? or what? a joystick. Yep, left and right. Um, I'm designing it for the Tandy Deluxe. But anything that has a self-center would work. But if you're in the center, you're always going to be on the left. So you can kind of cheat a little bit, I think, maybe. <laughs> hmm. um, I was going to do a three-way um, joystick uh, detection like I did in the menu, but I didn't like the way that it controlled, so I just switched it to two, left or right. So that's how it works. You press the button, and you chop down the tree, and you try to avoid uh, branches by switching sides. Oh, as the tree comes down, the branches come down. Yep. And you can either get hit on the head or you'll run out of uh, health. Okay. I don't think anybody would make it past 800 chops. I never have in the in the phone app, but that doesn't mean that nobody out there is better than me. But I don't <laughs> think anybody would make it over 800, but I'm going to make it so you can get at least 1,200 points. I'll just so. hack the bloody thing. What's that? I'll just hack the bloody thing. <laughs> 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 well, you... You might have an advantage over some people, Simon. <laughs> unlock that 6809 character. What's that? He'll unlock the 6809 character, no problem. <laughs> oh, well, that's a total amount of chops. So, like, oh. every time that you play the game, it saves how many times you've chopped in each game. And it oh. adds up. So, eventually, you'll get anybody will get to 6809. They just have to play it enough. But, yeah, I originally it. had that character set to, like, 4,000. And then the other day, I was like... You know, it might be kind of cool to make it 6809 and, you know, kind of cocoa it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Especially if it's like a, a lifetime uh, culmination of things mm -hmm. where you can just, you'll eventually get there. It was crazy with this game because, I, I mean, the title screen took me like six, seven months. Wow. <laughs> and then I go into the character selection screen and I did it. What was it, Simon? It was like a week or two that I had this done. And yeah. Like that, yeah. I kind of just was like shocked at how much more progress I'd made because Simon's been teaching me 6809 for the last year or more, and uh, he's really good at it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Newsflash. He's, he's, really, he's, really, he's, he's really patient, and um, he also has, uh, he kind of likes to do what Sockmaster does to him and not give you the answer, but kind of try to get you to think. About you know what, what that, you need to do? You know what that's referred to as? What's that? That's the Socratic method of teaching. The Socratic? Yes. Well, I call him sensei, but I know that's what <laughs> it's the academy is in Chinese, but, you know, Socratic yeah. method, huh? Yeah, from Socrates. Rather than giving you the answer, he'll ask you a series of questions that leads you to the answer. Well, he doesn't always ask me a series of questions. <laughs> but he, he, he causes you to question yourself to the yeah, answer. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, exactly. But, uh, so. But that's, that's where I'm at. That's absolutely and the best way to learn. Yeah. I agree. Yep. Because Put you in the driver's seat. Exactly. If you, I, I, I will help you. I help you along the mm -hmm. way. If you get right. stuck along the way. But I'd rather you think for yourself because then you're learning. It's not, it's not just a case of copying a textbook. Right. <laughs> absolutely. Right. right. So, yeah, it was kind of funny because uh, for the scroll-ins of the title screen and the character selection screen so they the um the objects move down four lines every every cycle and so in hexadecimal you're adding the hexadecimal value of 100 right <coughs> and so i kept loading in x adding 100 to it storing back x into the the variable location and simon's like hey do you think that there might be a better way to do that <clears throat> And so I looked at the code for a little bit, 
And I said, oh, yeah, we can just change one byte instead of two. And so then I changed it to, like, load A, increase A, store A. And then I thought, thinking more, but it took me a couple days to get back to them. But instead of actually loading anything, I could just increase the memory address by one and get the same effect. So I cut out, like, eight cycles doing that. And wow. he knew the whole time that all I had to do <laughs> was increase the address. Uh, but he didn't tell me. He said, it, what he said when I came up with the load A thing was, yeah, that's a good, that might be a good solution or something very yes, but no at the same time. Yeah, it's ambiguous. pretty ambiguous. So. <laughs> the, the teaser. Yeah. It, 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 it like, kind of reminds me of the old series Kung Fu. When you can <laughs> grab the pebble from my hand, you will be ready, Grasshopper. So. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it, it's, it's like you said, though, it's a good way to teach and learn because that really resonated with me. And so I was able to go back through, you know, however many lines of code I have and say, hey, where can I do this exact same thing to cut out cycles? Because there's a this game is really graphic intense, so I have to be really careful about how long I take in between cycles there. So, yeah. Yep. What I'm One... showing on screen right now is like when I get frustrated or bored with uh, Timberman. Uh -huh. it, my son and I have like a million game ideas, and one of them is uh, Buff Commando. Uh, <laughs> and these are just some sprites for uh, that. Kind of like a dungeon, or not Dungeons and Dragons, but Double Dragon uh, slash Okay. Now, thing. is that a gun in his hand? That is a gun. Okay. I, so, my son, thinks it looks like a potato gun, but... Okay. Or a uh, shotgun or a little mini bazooka or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so those are some of the things I did right there when I was bored. I made a sprite editor a few years ago that I'd like to get moved into assembly, but eventually we'll get there. Yeah, so, well, Glenn's cool. got... Uh, that, there's the, a lot of those tools are out there, too, because I know Glenn has posted a uh, sprite compiler. I think somebody else <laughs> has done one in the past, too. Yeah, but it doesn't let you edit actual, you know, drawings of the sprite. It just oh, okay. helps okay. make it a right. sprite that you've always made awesome. into assembly. My editor is awesome to me. Like, I I designed it for the way that I work. But the problem is I did it in basic. So as you can see, I'm, like, accelerating VCC right now <laughs> to get mm. it to work. But yeah. basically, you know, um, I'll, just, I'll just fire up an example right here. But you can edit right here in this window. Yeah, no, that's neat. And over here, it's based on a, a sprite editor that was in Mark Overmeyer's uh, program, Game Maker, which I used a lot to make pieces. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so the only thing was that I had an I had a rotate feature in some older versions of this, okay. but that thing took like five minutes to process, so I took it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know what that reminds me of? I did. I one summer when I was a kid on my Coco, I was trying to, and I didn't think of this idea here of the sprite editor where you could do it in grid format. I was just literally moving pixels on the screen and plotting pixels to make an mm -hmm. image that I would get and put from. But uh, that summer, neither of my joysticks worked, so I had to write my own little graphics drawing program in Basic that let me use my keyboard and mouse. And I came up with things where if I drew something facing to the left, I could like draw a box around it, copy it, and it would rotate it facing the other way. So I could make opposing views of the different characters and stuff like that. Because I was literally drawing everything by hand one pixel at a time. So I came up with some methods to um, you know, make my life a little bit easier. Um, really cool. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to do this because I like... I'd like to be able to try and like keep all of the uh, tools to make games on like the co the Cocoa's. I mean, mm -hmm. with the exception of using like LW Assembler because that thing is sweet. <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, um, uh, John Strong has his tools that he wrote on in Windows that you know cr did similar things. He's got sprite editors and sprite compilers and things that are. Windows GUI based tools that then create all the assembly code that he then I guess cross assembles over. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's got a tile editor and map yeah. editor and stuff too. I still do this and then open up Excel and uh, I, yeah. I do the compiling by hand. So wow. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Um, I was reading Glenn's uh, uh, his post. Well, not his post, but he has that blog where he has his compiler on there and. I was like, dang it, I wish I would have waited like 
months a year to start this project. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Whatever. You know, it's and and it's like you know, I haven't I haven't started my assembly journey just yet. And when I do it, it's like I know there's so many people out here. Like you have people like Simon and yourself, and you have, you have all these people with all this knowledge and all these modern ways to do things, but. Um, I, I want to start off doing it the old fashioned way. Cause I want to be able to, you know, uh, enjoy some of the struggle of what it was <laughs> like, of what it was like to have to do it back. You know, I want to do it on a real cocoa or at least an emulator, but I don't want to cross compile and stuff. I want to use like Ed Tasm or something like that, you know? So, um, that, that, that challenge is part of the fun. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's uh-huh. like, if you've never done it before, um, you, uh, you, cause like there's so many things you have an appreciation of if you, you know, when you, you had your cocoa back in the day, you have appreciation of the fact that if we had a game like Zaxxon or Donkey King or something like that, you appreciated the fact that somebody busted their ass to make this thing, you know, do something amazing. And you appreciated that you knew it wasn't easy and you knew it was something that the average person couldn't do. Um, so I've always had that kind of level of appreciation when you're older too you remember what it was like in the old days when i was a kid you know we didn't have these things you know we didn't <laughs> we didn't have air right we suffocated and we liked it you know <laughs> so yeah. it's you kids it's, with your oxygen these days you know <laughs> it's still a pain in the butt with lw yeah. assembler sometimes so yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah it, so i yeah, like i like that idea forgiven. I like that idea of what Simon's doing because rather than just answering all your questions, he's actually forcing you to think for yourself and come up with your own solutions. And um, again, like that's that's the old world way of doing it. When you were a kid, you ask your parents, "Hey, uh, mom, how do you do this?" And they'd say, "Well, go look it up." Right. So they just taught you to go to the book and become resourceful and learn for yourself, think for yourself, find for yourself. So uh, at the end, it's going to make you a stronger, better person for doing it that way too. You know. Yep. Absolutely. Hey guys, thanks for letting me share my stuff. Oh, not a problem. Thanks for sharing it with us. I love these little great. sneak love these little sneak peeks. It looks like you're making a lot of progress lately. Yeah, yeah, it went it went pretty quick. Uh, I got another slowdown with the with the health bar situation, but we'll we'll get over that. I'm thinking that I'm gonna try and implement a stack blast, um, but it scares me um, <laughs> because of the FRIQ implementation. Um, and Glenn Glenn and I uh, started connecting just this week i reached out to him he's he's a way awesome guy i don't think he's on here anymore but uh yeah i'm still here oh you are i didn't see your picture yeah he's he's way awesome he's been helping me we've been uh kind of uh going back and forth talking about stuff and he showed me his blog and he's helping me get through the stack blast because it was crazy i i was able to test so the background that you guys saw in the game gets drawn like every frame um just because I thought it was easier than keeping track of where all the objects were and saving them to a buffer and copying them back, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And so I did the stack blast method, and, of course, it bombed uh, quite a few times when I was trying it uh, in a subroutine, but I did it where I kind of unrolled it and just didn't do it. I didn't branch to a subroutine. I just did it right in the line, and it was so much faster. It was ridiculous. I think I went from... I think I went up to like almost 30 frames per second, which was, which is a good place to be. So oh, yeah. if I can figure out how to get there, that's what I'm going to be working on for this week. And who knows when it will be over, but that's what I'm going to be working on. So uh, One of the things I wanted to ask you before, too, is what resolution are you running in that in? Because I like it. I like that it's colorful, but still kind of blocky. It's Yeah, it's 128 by uh, 111. Hmm. Um, I really like that resolution too because it's, where the hell do you come up with one eleven? That's such a weird number. Well, if you take two twenty five and you divide it by you divide it by two, well, it's actually one twelve. I'm sorry, my bad. Okay, I'm thinking one eleven because I'm including the zero at the beginning. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> that's when you know you're thinking in assembly terms. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's, that's Case zero. <laughs> so it's one twenty eight by one twelve. Yep. So sixty four that- bytes wide. Yep. Wow, that's almost almost perfectly symmetrical. It's very close to symmetrical when it comes to your X and Y values there. The yeah, pixels I like, look really good. Yeah, I like it. It's kind of chunky looking. It's like a it's a really cool kind of style. Yeah, um, it just, makes it like, look more look retro. At, and also, the page you only have a six K page that you're working on. Okay, so that's, of that's like 8K. a P mode four screen, but with more color. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Well, in more lines. Yeah. Um, 
in the future, like I really like the two hundred and fifty six by one uh by like two twenty four um resolution two. That one's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty but close to symmetrical there too. Yeah. For my first uh assembly project, I didn't want to mess around with four different graphics pages to keep track of yet. So right, getting ready. Right. Because Buff Commando is going to be rather ambitious if I uh, pursue that next. I, I have, <laughs> I love- if I could make if I could make as many games as I think of, it'd be like in a short period of time, it'd be great. But, uh, right, right, right. Anyways, I'm done. Very I'm cool. done talking. <laughs> All right. Well, cool, cool. Thanks. Yeah, nice. for, thanks for doing that. Um, so I've missed I've missed an opportunity to run a commercial break. So we're gonna run two commercials right now, back to back. So if anybody needs to go, you know, pinch one off or whatever, you know, drop off a Dren core, you got a couple minutes here. I will run a couple of commercials and then we'll be back here in just a minute. And thanks, Paul. And feel free to hang out for as long as you like. Thanks, I will. Hi, I'm Mike Rowan, and you're watching the original gamer, Stevie Stroh. And when you're done watching, come over and listen to the Coco Crew Podcast. What's going on, everybody? The original gamer Stevie Stroh here, and I want to talk to you about Amacoconut.com. If you love the color computer like I love the color computer, then you got to visit Amacoconut.com, your one-stop shop for all of your candy color computer links needs. There you'll find links to blogs and podcasts and project sites and emulators and downloads and groups and communities. If you love the color computer, head on over to Amacoconut.com. That's I-M-A, Coconut.com. Tell them the original gamer Stevie Stroh sent you. Coco forever, people. It's a Radio Shack Merry Christmas. This year, I needed to give a real family pleaser. Honey, please help me with this budget. How about a new game, Dad? Please. And I found it. Radio Shack's Color Computer 2. On sale for just $99.95. It entertains, educates, manages. It's expandable and affordable. Now that really pleases me. The Color Computer 2. Sale price for Christmas. Only at Radio Shack. Hey, have you got your Coco 3 yet? Hi, this is Rick Adams, author of Temple of Rom and Shanghai, and you've tuned into Coco Talk, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. What's going on, everybody? Original Gamer Stevie Stroh here, and if you're a fan of vintage computing and retro gaming, then you're going to love our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. There you will find custom designs by Instagram artist Joel M. Adams. You can get Ama Coconut, Coco Talk, and other cool video game images on a t-shirt, coffee mug, or mouse pack. So if you love retro, then head on over to the retro swag shop at 8bit256.com today. Tell them the Original Gamer Stevie Stroh sent you. And we're back after a word from our corporate sponsors. This show's gone really commercial, though. You know, that's what I'm not liking about this at all. It kind of lost <laughs> its spirit of free enterprise and, and, and open source. It's become really much like a Microsoft product at this time. Um, but, yeah, we're back, everybody. And Wayne Campbell has joined us. How are you, Wayne? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for being uh, here again. As far as your uh, corporate entity goes, maybe you <laughs> need to fire the chairman. <laughs> yeah if only i had a golden parachute to go along with it so <laughs> um th- this reminds me last week when we were live streaming during my little view of the hurricane wayne was with us too and um it almost became like a little mini episode of coco talk because we all just ended up being on skype watching the pile of dirt across the street from my house blow <laughs> in the wind and everything that was kind of fun i was yeah. just glad you didn't get it any worse yeah, me too. You and me both, brother. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, that was a really cool thing you showed us. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. That's a cool little project. Look, there's there's so many things to look forward to. Like last week we showed off the packaging of um, bomb threat cartridges, and then John Linville's posted a few more pictures of the card that goes inside there. Karen, how are you, Karen? We haven't uh, didn't get a chance to say fully hello to you yet. Hello, Karen. Hello. How's it going? Very, very good. Very good. Glad to have you here, too. Was there anything you wanted to share as we were going through show and tell at the beginning of the show? Uh, yeah, well, I've not got much. I've been tinkering with actual, but a couple of things came up on the Dragon Archive forum. Uh, hardware projects. They look pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. 
I know that some of that stuff you guys were putting in the um, in the Skype chat earlier. Is there anything you want me to bring up to show that that we could talk Let's about? See. Um, here's a link. I'll paste it into the Skype chat. Okay. Yeah. Archiveworldofdragon.com. This is. Me... Hold on one second. I'm gonna. I need to switch it over where everybody else who's watching can see it too. So give me two seconds here. Okay, so we're looking at the moo. How do you pronounce that? Moo? Oh, no idea. Mo? <laughs> but, but that's moo. what I can say. The moo. Moo. I don't know. The moo. Memory and SPI board. Yeah, um, Tormod's the latest thing. Okay, and Tormod is the guy who works on Toolshed? Uh, yes. Yeah, all sorts of things. <laughs> okay, this has got an SD card in it. Micro SD card. Um, 512K RAM upgrade? Okay, is that what this chip here is? I guess so. Looks like static RAM. These look like a couple of chipsets of some kind here. And then what would go in this little socket here with the little dips? Yeah, no idea. It's all very exciting, isn't it? <laughs> but if you read okay. down, he's adding... Um, so this is basically he's doing a next generation for something he'd done before. Um, okay. But this time he's adding MMU functionality and he's making it sort of semi Coco three compatible. It's okay. very interesting. So that's for the for the Dragon and presumably for the Coco one and two. Okay. You can get some Coco three style MMU goodness. Part par, pardon my ignorance, but what does an SPI interface? What does SPI mean? Oh, it's serial programmable interface, maybe. Something okay. Like that. It's the way it's the way he accesses the SD card, I think. There's, okay. there's a lot of uh, uh, chips that communicate back and forth. There's SPI and I2C. Um, so SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface, lets two exchange ah. information. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I've never, I've never dealt with it. So. I actually have. I've actually built some stuff that uses it. Okay, so it says it has a ROM socket for booting without drive wire or multipack. An NX32 banking scheme is ditched, which has no compatibility. A DAT, dyna Dynamic address translator or MMU pretty much uh, compatible with the one on the Coco 3. A four port SPI interface and SD card socket remains the same. Okay, uh, it looks really interesting. So basically this is giving a Coco 1 or 2 class machine some Coco 3 um, software capabilities I would say. Is that a yeah, and he's already porting Nitrous 9 or Nitro S9, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> Level 2 to it, which is... The question kind of, of cool. the week. That is very cool. Uh, and, and so, where is Tormod based out of? Another very good question. Okay. Switzerland. Location, Switzerland. Okay. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. It's right there on the internet page. Switzerland. What's... What, um, again, I'm a dumb American, but I would imagine that in Switzerland they speak some native tongue of their own, right? Would that be called Swiss? Is that the it's, language of yeah. Switzerland? They speak Swiss? They speak yeah. German, German, Italian. It's like Swiss German and Italian? Swiss and, German. Yeah. They have three official languages. And they speak English, too. Okay. Okay. That's pretty cool. And it's another hardware project. It's... Um, my God, the amount of hardware projects we have that just continues to boggle the mind. And um, not only are there projects that are things that are actually being built, but then there's always the debate on what should we build or what could we build or what would we like to build. It's just sometimes I just I feel like my head is going to explode when it comes to, you know, the variety of things that exist and that are like on the horizon. It's it's so interesting that we live in a time where somebody can imagine something and actually make it um, with, you know, the ability to have printed circuit boards made up online and things that just would not have been technologically possible or just affordable in, in pro probably even in the 90s, you know. Um, but the fact that people can make these things and imagine them and produce them, um, it's really neat. And I think it just... Um, 
it, it, it kind of reminds me of a lot of lines from Jurassic Park. You know, I keep thinking of Jeff Goldblum. It's like you stood on the backs of giants and you, you were so worried about, well, could I make it? Did you ever stop to think of, should I make it, you know? <laughs> so it's just like with great power comes great responsibility when it comes to all these things that we can potentially build. And then the discussions of, is it still a cocoa? And when does a cocoa stop becoming a cocoa? And all these things. And We've had the discussions of the new generation hardware cocos, like the FPGAs and all these other systems. There's just so much going on. It's just, I mean, my head's swimming with, with potentials and and things. You know, it's just like. My it's God, always better to have too many projects and products <laughs> than too few. So yes, that is very true. Um, and and obviously, this is not unique to our system or our community. Because as I start listening to more podcasts, like I listen to. One of the most recent floppy days where Randy Kindig was at like a VCF East or something. Yeah, I think it was VCF East he was at. And he was interviewing guys from the TI community and from the um, Amiga community and, and a couple other systems. And so all of these different platforms have the people who are making all these cool hardware projects to enhance and extend the systems and add more functionality. And there are certain things that make sense, like a, to be able to make a a composite output or a, a VGA output or now even now it's like VGA seems a little passe so HDMI just seems to make sense if you're gonna make anything why stop at composite or VGA uh, why not just make everything default to HDMI because that's the current standard you know and you got a lot more options there so um, you know all these different things on the horizon very Definitely very cool still some debate there though isn't there yeah I think with HDMI you end up rendering a whole frame at once and some people would say that the being it that your eye can track the scan on a CRT very quickly. So keeping keeping the analog signal is very useful. Yeah, agreed. Of course, agreed. those people may be lying. Uh, Michael Newman in the live chat says, "I think anything that helps to introduce new generations to the Coco is a good thing as well." And I agree with that too. Um, I am I, I am not as much of a purist. I would say where. Um, I'm okay with uh, with a Coco Plus type scenario. I'm I'm okay with that. Some of the things that I start to question are like some of the things that David Ladd does <laughs> when he starts to get into, well, I got this serial port now where I can go to 900 kilobits. I can almost get a megabit over an RS-232 port. And now I can run DriveWire at this kind of speed and all these other things like that. And that kind of stuff is cool as it is. And that's something that doesn't interest me as much as something like a music synthesizer that I can hear and appreciate. You know, a super fast serial port is cool, but it's not sexy. You know, synthesizers and colors and sound, that's sexy to me. You know, so to each their own. It's not right or wrong. It's just what, you know, what, 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 does, what flame does each moth gravitate to? You know, and to me, it's always the shiny objects that I'm interested in. So, Just get uh, a Disney sound source and then you can kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> <laughs> it has to be noted that this hardware project is yet another one that doesn't put a sound sound. I know, on. I know. It just, it, to me, it's like whatever we need to do is we need to basically put it all in the coco sdc and it needs to have you know we need to have that all-in-one solution that's got audio hardware memory upgrades sd card capabilities uh, maybe even the ability to have higher fidelity um, audio sampling with low cpu overhead um it's got a socket on it it's got a socket on it why not put a sid chip in it ha <laughs> Hey, it's a socket, right? Yeah, <laughs> SID, SID, SID chip. Are SID chips still available? There's yeah. actually third-party sources making compatible ones in case you blow them up. Okay. Wow. The link. That's mm -hmm. very impressive, given that it, there's lots of analog inside them, isn't there? Yeah, they are. The SID is a wicked, wicked, wicked piece of kit. Oh, definitely. <laughs> And plus, a lot of people use those in, uh, they'll mod their Commodore 64s or 128s by putting in a second SID chip to get stereo music yeah. out. So. That's cool. We need somebody named Socket Master, I think, to design that. For you. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Another so pretty pretty neat project. Wait. This is Paul, and my, uh, nope. my opinion on new hardware is that it's all really awesome. Um, but 
like I don't necessarily agree with developing software or games or whatever that's specific to any of those hardware because I think you're kind of limiting who you can distribute to and who can possibly enjoy that because I mean Coco 3 is obviously a hobby for me and I love it Mm -hmm. but I don't know if I want to spend like you know hundreds of dollars to have to get all this gear to to do you know like one game or whatever you know that's the only that's the only thing I have about it other than that all of it's really sweet that's Nick's point as well, and, and his ultimate decision on Gunstar of just making it the software is because when one there's competing standards for people bringing out song cards, and uh, which one do you want to support? Do you want to take the effort to support them all? And then it becomes you know less fun as a hobby when you're having to do all this driver support. Right. Ex- absolutely. But you've also got the chicken and the egg thing because if if you don't have anybody developing anything and sometimes you have to do it yourself, then nobody's going to bother trying to support it and you won't ever get a standard. So right. that's true. Yeah, why, why and, bother making the hardware at that point, right? And that was also one of the problems with uh, why so few games supported the sound speech pack is you know it was expensive to get and many of the developers didn't have it to use. So. Mm-hmm. Well, its implementa- its implementation was quite lame as well. Right, and it required a multi pack if you wanted to do a disc based game. That if, was the other if, problem. If there was a holy grail, um, Coco SDC that had everything you could ever want built into it, and it was somewhere in the neighborhood of about a hundred dollars, I would buy one today. Yes, if, if there was a Coco SDC that did everything that Coco SDC already does. And they just added uh, one or two sound uh, synthesizers to it, maybe the uh, Orchestra 90, a couple of 8-bit DACs, and then anything else that you can squeeze in there, um, especially anything that can help make digital audio without having to tax the CPU, so any type of digital sound enhancement chip that could be thrown in there, and we can make this super card, then you you would not need an MPI. It would be a standard, and and all you gotta do is develop the software for it, stick it on a you know disk image, put it in your Coco SDC, and poof, you're done. To me, it makes the most sense to do it that way, um, mm-hmm. and not need a multi-pack interface, and have that be a standard. Right now, the Coco SDC is a standard, and it's been a standard for a while. Um, we need the we need the SDC multimedia edition, you know, and have that be <laughs> the new the new standard. That's just my opinion. You know, I don't yeah, know how I to love- make it, and reasonably priced. Yeah, I, mean, I love the yeah. SDC, man. It's great. It's it's a little the... bit of a different thing, though, standards-wise, because the SDC is completely compatible with a floppy controller, so you've got that built-in software drivers are done. You didn't have to write anything except for the ROM, right? Because yep. basically it'll read as if it's a regular floppy controller. There's no compatibility problems with OS 9. no compatibility problems with RS-DOS. Whereas with sound, I mean, if you pick an ORC 90 or if you pick a sound speech pack or you pick one of the newer SID-based ones, there's very little software that takes advantage of that. You still have the... I have to write a driver or I have to write the software to use it. That's okay though if there's a standard that if it, if it's on if it's on the Coco SDC and somebody just says, Okay, here's the line, we've drawn the line, this is this is the sound chip we're gonna put in the Coco SDC and we're gonna stick the the Orchestra ninety in there too. And then boom, that's it. And then anybody yeah. who wants to develop for the SDC Music Edition will develop for that. And then uh, you don't have to worry about somebody not being able to play it. Um, I but did you like, come up with what, what is the standard going to be? Because, I mean, you can try to make the sound speech packs a standard because there is already software that supports it. You can go a stage higher and you do a SID-type chip. Or you can go way higher and do something like the MP3 WAVs. And then you can mm-hmm. have, like, full digitized sound with no, you know, no, no CPU tasking at all. And you could do sound like a real arcade game. Mm-hmm. So which I'd one do you pick? There's already a standard ready, ready and waiting. Where so is that? that? Well, the Dragon Alpha... Did have an AY chip in it. Hmm. Now, the fact that it was never actually released and it was only ever a set of prototype machines, neither here nor there. An actual sort of related machine did actually have a sound chip built in. Hmm. So yeah, the, uh, the Deluxe Coco. The Deluxe yeah. Coco yeah. was supposed to have that too. There we go. And there were 50,000 of those boards actually made. Job hmm. done. You know what I just started watching too because I just finished I finished watching all of Silicon Valley so now I'm starting to watch Halt and Catch Fire and I just finished watching season one of that and I think it was episode four was the one that Rick Adams was involved with where they were doing the Colossal Cave adventure and he did that whole web version of that 
Um, that's an interesting show too, just looking at how they were doing all the prototyping and, and engineering in the 80s, you know. I know it's, it's slightly dramatized and fictionalized, but I believe it's probably fairly accurate to what that struggle was like. It was kind of, it's kind of an inter interesting show to watch. Uh, developing, and you know, there like, was kind of a race to develop a new PC clone, you know. Uh, interesting times. But yeah, they, they're, that's, that's always the challenge with all this hardware. There's choices, there's options, and then we really have, uh, as a community, you know, we have, you know, whatever it is, pick a number, there's a thousand members, but how many of these members are actively developing commercial grade software for their Cocoa? You can pretty much count them on maybe one hand and a few extra fingers. Less than two hands, you need to count the active developers that are making things. So if we had, you know, so we've got what, maybe 1% of our community is, is developing this kind of stuff. If we had like 10 to 30% of our community that was developing and there was a larger base of people to make things, then maybe that you could have more people coming from different angles and trying all these different hardware options and we could see and hear and taste and touch these different things. But really, it's, it's, it's almost like it's a pipe dream. Uh, and I think probably the, well, Ed Snyder's got his board that's already available that you can buy that's got the sound chip and he's got media players for it. And so that's cool. That's a product, and it could be used. Um, and I like John Linville's <coughs> approach where you can put it on the cartridge. And so the cost is, is minimal to the software, so you can sell a $40 game on a cartridge with a synthesizer built into it. So that's reasonable because you would have spent that much on the game anyways. Um, I like that option. What's wrong with the Motron program? What was that, Ron? Uh, someone come up with a motor on uh, program to run your mp3s through your coco sound were you aware of that it's a simple program evidently it was up on the uh, facebook thing no i didn't see that yeah so they're playing mp3s through the uh, cassette player? Wow. yeah <laughs> it's kind of simple Okay, yeah. and so you so it was just like one large recording that was like on your phone or something, and you just yeah, it you, played it like it was coming through a tape. You use your cassette, for, you know, line in, uh -huh. and then sound off, and then you can Sorry. Uh, push play. <laughs> oh, okay. You had to manually uh, play and pause it on the phone or whatever to get yeah. it to come through to Coco. Something like that. Okay, interesting. Yeah, you, you could come up with a control protocol to go to something and tell it, you know, play from this start point to this end point type thing and just use the audio on equivalent, you know, from the cassette yeah. port. You could do it that way, too. After all, OS9 was a control program for machines, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool stuff. Simon, you, you want us to um, fire up one of your latest demo videos that you got out there on Facebook? Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Go ahead. All right, I need a minute to find it on Facebook, so I'm going to run a quick commercial while I find the latest video, and I'll have that queued up. So we'll be right back, people. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with more Coco Talk in just a minute. People have big plans after school. You know what Elliot's going to do? Jeff, too. Elliot's at work on a book report using Scripsit on Radio Shack's Color Computer 3. It hooks up to his TV. And Jeff's at his Radio Shack Color Computer 3 playing the newest football game. But wait, what's Elliot doing playing new Super Pitfall? And Jeff's having a blast with a new math tutor. You never know what you might try with more than 100 programs for fun and learning. Radio Shack's Color Computer 3 comes with everything you see here. Other items each sold separately. Only at Radio Shack. Hello, this is David Ladd, and you're watching Original Gamer Stevie Stroh. What's going on, everybody? Original Gamer Stevie Stroh here, and when you are done with Coco Talk, why not head on over to my YouTube channel and get your share of gameplay goodness? There you will find everything from the old school to the next gen. There are video game reviews, interviews, how to's, and replays of Coco Talk. So, for all of your video game needs on YouTube, head on over to youtube.com slash OG Stevie Stroh for your share of gameplay goodness today. Radio Shack, store-wide manager's red tax. All right, well, we're here. And this is one of Simon's latest demos. And he's... Oh, and I have a few things down here queued up, too, that I, I had saved from before that we want to show off. 
um, uh, including uh, one of Antonio's latest Coco Talk renderings. This guy's been an animal creating all these different videos. So let's take a look at one of Simon's latest mad demos here. That was pretty cool. That was kind of like, oops, stop. Don't keep playing videos on me, Facebook. I did not give you permission to continuously play videos, Facebook. That is an invasion of my privacy. Since when does Facebook need your permission? <laughs> I'm not seeing anything you're putting up. Yeah, I didn't uh, see it either. You, uh, is my screen sharing stopped? It's like Skype has gone haywire right now, too. There's a little yeah. live chat window from there. But it's, yeah, it's yeah like I don't see you at all. And I didn't see the last commercial either. Uh, yeah, it's coming that? through on YouTube fine. It's just the Skype chat. It's not. Or Skype calls. The, the I, Skype, I've the been Skype seeing windows. everything on YouTube, but it's like five seconds behind the audio. <laughs> That's normal. Well, the, um, the, the, the window is kind of... Um, there we go. What the hell is going on there? Okay, who's, whose video is this? Richard Lorbieski is trying to get in. That's weird. The screen was just all kind of jacked up there. Um, freaking Skype, I swear to God. Uh, so, yeah, that's a pretty cool demo there, Simon. That is um, kind of like one of the plasma display things that you've done in the past where the little wavy lines kind of very fluidly kind of move around, and then you've got multi-voice music playing in the background too. So it looks like you're implementing a lot of techniques I've seen from you in the past and putting them all together in a new way. Uh, it looks pretty just, sexy. Just, uh, just uh, for assembly, it's like, okay, I've got all this stuff, so bam, in your face. Uh, are you guys not seeing the screen anymore? No, not Steve, at all. all we got is a little okay. live chat corner. I just, I just re-shared the screen. That's somebody else's video, I think. I'm it's funny, I'm YouTube, I'm seeing the pictures of everybody in the chat, but in Skype, it's a blank screen with a little loading circle. Well, going that's on. because you got to click on somebody. I had that same thing, and that is that's actually Richard Lorbieski's video trying to come through. So if you click off of that and click onto um, the window that's got the rainbow colors and make that full screen, oh, that then you should see everything. Yeah. Okay, I got it back. Got it back. Yeah. Yeah, the weird things going on with Skype today. I think it's something in the ionosphere that's going on there. Who the hell knows? So, um, cool stuff. So, uh, what else can you tell us about that demo? It's pretty cool. I like it. Yeah, well, I didn't. I didn't actually see what video you showed. Did you show? The, you showed the plasma, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let me pull it up again then, since you did not see it. So hold on one second. Are you guys still still able to see the screen? Pretty cool stuff. Okay, um, the music here is not. Uh, it, it's just. It's just for effect. Okay. Uh, it's not the actual music being used in the demo because um, my one bit friend from the ZX Spectrum scene, uh, UTZ Utz, is working on a totally new tune that you've never heard before. Okay. And you had another version of that demo with the uh, your vector graphic uh, 3D box drawing too, right? Yes, it's the same because this is actually showing you that I can do other things in that window because what I'm doing is making a multi-part demo. Mm, mm. If you, I, if you um, look at... Uh, is there any way I can send a file? Of course. You can drag it into the Skype chat. Or I can go to I can go to your page. Um, I can go to your Facebook page yourself if you have it there. There's one no, that's called One much, Step Behind. No. Yeah. I'll just find a file, but you need 
you need a uh, you need a Coco two to do this because VCC goes wild because <clears throat> VCC is like uh, okay if you poke FFD seven with something I'm gonna blow you to full fast mode. Okay, and I'll pull it up in like um, X roar. That's fine. Okay, let me just find a file for you. Okay. Um, Paul was saying that he can only see my insert coin logo. You've got to, you've got to click on the. There's, you got to click on my screen share and make that full screen. My screen share has got all the rainbow colors on it. So um, if you click on just that one window and maximize that window, you should see the whole, the whole chat, Paul. Uh, Norlander in the chat was asking a question. Nor Norlander says, "Was there ever a controller developed similar to the Disto SC2?" But with IDE instead of SCSI. I looked at Cloud9, but he has sold out, and I tried to contact Glenside. No answer as of yet. Yeah, I'm not sure if anybody's actively making the IDE board still or not. Hmm. Yeah, we saw you trying to get in, Richard. I don't know why. I kept trying to click on to let you on, but you had like a little spinning thing for a while, Richard, where just you weren't you weren't like coming through the stream or something yeah as far as cloud nine i don't think he mark had any plans of uh, producing another batch of the super ides um so i think the people that last ordered from him that was it um as far as yeah the glenn side i don't know um i i think the guy that was handling the Glenside IDE boards was um, Brian something. I can't think of his last name. So, the Shoebring or somebody else? I don't know. <laughs> I talked to him at the fest, but I, I'm bad at names. So, of course, I'm not all here anyway. When have yeah. you ever been? And it's getting harder to find ID drives because it's going to SAT anyway. So, the SDC might be a better. A better option anyway unless you have specific hardware you're trying to hook it up to okay that is 4800 okay i need to switch it over everybody who's watching live can also see it so if i execute this this should this should execute by itself because i just loaded it in no you need to supply the load address okay 4800 no actually e00 E zero ah. zero. Yeah. It's crunched. Okay. Can you guys see and hear that? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wicked. I can't hear you guys over the music right now. Uh, just turn it off. Okay, that was pretty cool. So now it's on a Coco 1 or 2, too. Yeah, it's a Coco yeah. 1 or 2, and it's running 0 0.89 megahertz. Yeah, that's neat. Now the um, the speed of the rotation has gotten a little bit slower. I imagine that's because of the music eating yes. up some CPU. Uh, I actually I actually had three voice music on that, and I decided to take it down to two voice. Okay. Because of the fact that I'm using the interrupt. Um, okay. I didn't want to interleave uh, with the code because it was too convoluted. Um, if you if it was running on Coco three, if you ran that on something like VCC, it would go mad. Hmm. It so would be which can't get done was hooked up the uh, fast interrupt to the cartridge RS two thirty two. Yeah. Now what what Just do the dump. initials TIM stand for in the right hand corner of your uh, circuit board graphics? The Invisible Man. Ah, is that your? Uh, that's your that's hacker my, name, your computer that's handle? My, that's my old C64 screen. <laughs> the, in, the invisible man. You cannot yeah. see me. 
<laughs> That's really cool. I love seeing stuff like that. So, now, it's, but, uh, it says Tandy Assembly on there, and I believe you already answered this question. You're not going to be able to make it to Tandy Assembly, right? I'm not going to be able to make it, but I've got someone who would proxy for me. Okay, I was going to say, if you didn't, if you needed me to run a disk for you, I'd be happy to run a disk for you as well. You yeah. Send me, send me the image of the things to, to run. That'd be kind of so, cool. At the moment, I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm trying to fit what I can into 64K. It's, it's 64K only. Yeah, yeah, well, that's neat. That's neat. Ron, so if, have, go ahead. if you look Sorry. at the size of that binary file, it's only about six k. Okay. Because it's crunched, and I will thank, I will thank Kieran there for his brilliant DZip. Yes, yeah, six thousand five hundred and nineteen bytes. How big is it uncrunched? Uh, well, the music itself resides at. Um, uh, resides where the basic ROM resides, and the music itself uncrunched is about 16k. Wow, you got uh, 16k of music all crammed down into a 6k binary. Yeah, 16k of music, and that's about three and a half minutes of patterns. Um, the code itself is only about one and a half k. For the, for the vector rotations. Okay. Uh, but it uses two screens, one at 1,000 and one at 3,000. So that's 12K right there on your two screens. 12K plus two, for two, two high-res screens. Right, right. and you got your 1.5K of code, so oh. now you're up to like almost 16K there, plus your 16K of sound, now you're at 32K right there. So. Yeah, uh, but it's not a problem because the sound carries across from part to part. Yeah. That's neat. Those are the things I didn't fully understand back in the day was how much memory it took up just to do the graphic screen, you know, um, where, uh, you, you know, the, the I, you could criticize the 4K game saying, man, these things look like crap. But when you realize that almost all of that RAM went to just the display, how exactly. much how much RAM did you have left to do any decent code with, <laughs> you know? So exactly. the, the fact they can make any type of game run in 4K, knowing that is pretty impressive. And you throw audio on top of that, it's even more impressive. So um, I, I remember yeah. when I first fiddled with machine language and I, or tried to fiddle with it, I didn't really know what I was doing. But I, I was basically programming the SAM and the VDG on a 4K Coco 1, which was my first one. I put it into the P mode 4 and it actually would kick it into the graphics mode but you'd see like your text screen with your cursor flashing with a bunch of bars and then you'd see a little bit of code and then you'd see a chunk of rom and it was just you, know, you could you could actually make a game in a higher res but it would be only the very top part of the screen and you have random garbage just shifting around as your variables and stuff ah. works same problem with the MC10 yeah MC10 is capable of 256 by 192 but it didn't connect the bloody last address line Hmm. On the VDG, so so you only get in if you're selecting a 6K screen, you're only getting 4K because they didn't connect A7. So right. what's the display and it's extra 2K in that case? Well, yeah, but you can't shift it about because there's no sun. Presumably, it shadows. You get the first 2K again. Oh, so it duplicates the on the MC10. The MC10 will display junk. And the other thing they'd done wrong with the MC10 was put interrupt vectors on the screen. Okay, what does that mean? <laughs> well, if you wanted a timer IRQ to play music on the MC10, which is about the only IRQ you've got is a, is a, that's decent, is a timer IRQ, because H-Sync and V-Sync weren't connected either. Um, that resides on screen, so you're going to have to hide your jump... XXX in some graphics. So that means you're oh, going to see an weird. anomalies on the screen if you're doing anything graphical. Well, no, it's only free instructions. It's only it's only like three bytes, so it's only twenty four pixels. Hmm. So okay. It's not bad. Bad. I mean, you could hide it. You could hide it, but but a lot of bad choices made. Yeah. Yeah. I think the first bad choice was to make the machine, unfortunately. But uh, it's uh, it's a neat machine. But they they they, they cut even they cut more corners on that than they did in the Coco. 
Yeah. Yes. But but they could have provided the timer IRQ from the MC10 into the Coca. Wasn't it built so into the 6803 they though? Out, they cut out the H sync and the V sync IRQ from the Coca and put it onto the MC10. And here we have two machines that are very capable. Yeah. And oh shit. You fall short. Why? For, for the sake of for the sake of one I mean for the last address line, for the sake of one circuit trace or, or connecting up the H sync whatever or the V sync, it's like Okay, why did you make these choices? No, I can't answer those questions. They were probably, like, you know, everything I read from reading Boys and Bill's book, it was all about saving money, whatever we can do to cut costs and all about profit. You know? But also, so. not, they also tried to not compete with themselves. So if you start getting a machine in the lower end price mark getting too close to the higher end ones, they'd purposely cripple it. Yeah, yeah, which is, I think, part of the problem with the Coco 3 living at the same time as the Tandy 1000. They, yes. Not only did they want to cut costs, but they didn't want to compete with themselves, which doesn't make sense because if you're selling machines, you're selling machines, and they're your machines, you're still getting money, you know? It's just, it's just so many things, well, which is why they're not here anymore, right? So yes. may they rest I mean, in peace. Yeah, that's a good point, though. I mean, the original, the original Coco 3 computer competing with the TRS-80. <laughs> Oh, even the Model 1 and 3, they didn't want to yeah. be competing with that. And I, I don't think, uh, yeah, uh, I think there, it would have been hard for it to do that, to compete in the business space anyways, because it didn't have the, 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 you know, those type of monitors and that type of software and stuff. So, But, but uh, if look, look, for example, like the t original Tandy 1000 with CJ graphics, I mean, the Coco 3, or EJ, I guess Tandy's 16-color mode, but you could have done the Coco, you could have had BASIC built in to use the full 320 by 225 or 640 by 225 which would have been higher than the Tandy 1000. And they didn't. Right, 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 right. Okay, Paul Thayer says he's got to go. Yeah. Paul, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being with us. So Paul says he's got to go by and fix the toilet. So apparently David Ladd was by his house earlier today and broke that. So... Um. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of his testing. <laughs> Trying to find glitches in the matrix. So uh, thanks for joining <laughs> us, Paul, and thanks for sharing a little insight to your uh, Timberman. That's a cool-looking game. Um, yeah, cool demo. Always appreciate seeing that kind of stuff. Ron Delvo, you want to do a Ron's Garage segment here I'm in a ready. minute? You're ready? All right, I'm going to take a commercial break, and then we're going to come back and introduce you like a professional broadcasting show here, and we're going to get jump into a Ron's Garage segment. So we'll be right back, people. Now, we've slashed prices 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. Save on famous Radio Shack Hi-Fi, car stereo, radios, toys, TV games, calculators, walkie-talkies, and CB radios. Look for the big red tag. Save like never before on these and literally hundreds of red tag specials. Hurry into Radio Shack today. Hey, this is Bruce Moore, author of Force of Doom, and you're watching the original gamer, Stevie Stroke. Are you ready? For the forest of doom. Hi, this is John Linville. And Neil Blanchard. We are the Coco Crew. I hope you're enjoying watching Stevie Strobe play video games, especially the Coco games. And when you're done with that, check out our podcast at CocoCrew.org. At home. At the beach. In your car. At the shop. At the office. Anywhere you enjoy fine audio programming. It's North America's premier source for color computer news. 
the Coco Crew Podcast. This is John Linville and Neil Blanchard, and we are the Coco Crew. I hope it's going to be a great show. Join John and Neil each month as they bring the latest news about the color computer, Dragon, MC10, and others. It's the Coco Crew Podcast. Visit www.cococrew.org and listen today. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, especially the sexy ladies, are you ready for Ron's Garage with a peek into the past featuring the vintage computing collection of Ron Delvo, who looks like he's talking to his wife in the background right now. So without any further ado, take it away, Ron. <laughs> and we're back and um and karen just so you know you you just mentioned that you were not able to post a link i have just knighted you sir so i now dub the sir karen anscombe you may rise and you may now post links um in the uh, youtube chat so uh, <laughs> uh in realize royalty was required <laughs> Ron, you have been, had a busy week this week posting all kinds of pictures in Facebook and, uh, and in our OS9 group. So um, you have the floor. Do you want me to switch to the Facebook page or are you going to show us stuff right up? Oh, here we go. Oh, this here. is. Oh, okay. It's a really cool device to have a hard drive. Okay, so let me just interrupt you for one second. So for those who might be listening later who can't see this, what Ron is holding up right now is a Tandy hard drive controller. It looks kind of like a speech sound pack. It's a little bit bigger. I guess it looks like a floppy drive controller too. Um, yeah, but that's the Honkin' big ribbon cable on it. Yeah, honkin' big yeah. ribbon cable. What what was that? Was that SCSI or what was that actual form? Sassy, I believe. Yeah, Sassy. Yeah, Sassy. Wow, so it's a regular Tandy. This question came up a week or two ago. Did Tandy have hard drives? And that answer was yes. This is a Tandy hard drive controller for the color computer. There's the That's manual. the one that Steve Bjork was talking about with us a okay. few weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. I think the biggest drive it handled was 20 megs. Okay. No, uh, it handled bigger than that. It did uh, 1535, and it might have even done 70. Instruction oh, really? manuals. What's the date on there? It's hard to get a focus on that. Um, yeah, I could have done the 70s. No. Nah. Does he mean what the price of it was? Do you know what the price was back then, Ron, by any chance? It says copyright 1985 on here. Okay, the so original, yeah, the original price was $129. That's not that terrible of a price. And that's I mean, just the adapter. That's not the actual controller. That was built into the primary drive thing. Back yeah, okay. I had the price. I didn't have this controller. <laughs> okay. That's oh, neat, though, to see, and it's in the box. So this is an official Tandy-branded hard drive controller with the big wide ribbon cable. That's cool. Anyone ever have one of these? TRS-80 computer I reference one of those. handbook. Wow, that's neat. A reference book. That reminds me of, like, what, the O'Reilly books or whatever, those little mini pocket reference ones? Not only that, but they also made... Uh, oh, look at that, a leather binder one. TRS-80 Pocket Handbook. Yeah, it looks like a little leather binder. And inside is... Oh, that was for the pocket computer, wasn't it? No, I, I don't think so. It's just a pocket handbook that would fit in your shirt handbook pocket. It has um, terms, like... Oh. Uh, and that's neat. Now everything that you're showing us, these are things that you had originally. So this is you just yeah. you've you've just had a spit ton of technology in your lifetime, and you've held on to every single piece of it. Uh, on a service manual, manual for the TRS-80 color computer too. That's nice. Binder clips. The one. Color computer one service manual. So where would have these have originally existed? Is this something that you might have had, Richard Lorbieski, when you were working in the uh, repair areas of the tech shops? Uh, yeah, they, they those books were issued uh, to the shops, but you can also yeah. order them through National Parts. Okay. 
That's neat. You're just you're seeing all the schematics for everything that's going on in the system. Okay, C E R Comp. Uh, what does that say? Window Writer. What is that? A word processor? Yeah, it's a um, it's a documentation for it. I had the program. You know, I had the uh, documentation. Neat. They also made Window Master. Window Master, and what is that? Like a spreadsheet or something? It's a uh, it's like a um, like OS nine has for uh, Windows. Windowing. Uh, it's uh, like. W like Window Master was CIRCOM's windowing system for RS DOS, and then uh, they made some programs, including Window Writer, that actually used that system. That's okay. the one that they used to advertise you didn't have to be an OS9 rocket scientist to make movable windows. Hmm. Neat. A full turn of the screw, a complete collection of turn of the screw articles from Rainbow Magazine from January 83 to July 89. Tony DiStefano. Wow. Turn of the screw awesome. articles. So that was like a hardware column or something? Yep. Yeah, that was Tony's column. Yeah. Good stuff in there. Neat. Popular. Uh, man, you got such a collection. I need to come and just hang out with you sometime and just soak it all in. You got so much cool stuff. Oh, that's like the little calculator style computer, huh? Pocket Computer 3. Oh, yeah, the sharp. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a sharp product, yeah. You have to get uh, tabs on it. Oh, neat. For your different sections, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Tandy tended to do that. I know there was a couple of things they had that, while it had the Radio Shack label on it, they uh -huh. were actually made by uh, Texas Instruments. Okay. <laughs> All right, I got something else here that uh, is not uh, Radio Shack. Or, uh, is anybody Compu ever... Facts. This Compu Facts. Compu Facts. Awesome book for... Um, MS DOS stuff. Okay. It's, a, uh, it's all about how to um, service and take care of uh, uh, MS DOS machines. You know, it's That's like neat. A repair your PC book, you know, it has all about memory and chips and interesting things. It was really good. Back in the day, this was really cool to have. And I found um, my RS232 program pack information. Thing that came with it. Oh, I remember that. Wow. Book. <laughs> These came in a blister pack with uh, the program packet, you know, in the front of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then now, uh, I have found other books. TRS 80 graphics. I've got one similar to that. Yeah, that, I love those things. Don Inman. Don yeah, Don and his son uh, did the Coco version of that. TRS-80 programs. Yeah, neat, neat, neat. All right, and then now, uh, you saw this. <laughs> I posted. 500 pokes, peaks, and execs. Oh, I love those things. I think I've got a few of those from uh, a couple of Coco Fests ago. Yeah, yeah I and remember then there those. Was, uh, an additional um, 500 or 1,000 or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a Coco 3 have... version as well. Yeah. The guy from uh, Microcom Software sold this, and this was, uh, I used to live in Rochester, New York, and this guy was in Fairport, New York, which is like a suburb, and I used to go over to their um, little office thing. In fact, I did science for him. <laughs> it was interesting. Neat. Yeah. They were one, one of the Microsoft. biggest suppliers, actually, for the cocoa in the, the late 80s there, and they did Word Power and a bunch of other things, too. Yeah. Disto Super Products Super Controller. Yeah, I found my uh, instruction booklet for it. Which is good to have. Also, uh, everybody's seen this Bill Barden book. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have that one. Color computer graphics. That's and that's yeah. a neat one. Here's a here's one. How to program microcomputers. Also by <laughs> William Barden. William Barden, neat. Okay, that that reminds me of the Lance Leventhal interview that recently just came up on uh, the Antic podcast too. That was interesting to hear to hear him again. Yeah. Uh, line three. printer. Wow. TRS-80 microcomputer system. Line printer That's 7. One in a box. Wow. Yeah. And then, uh, this is for uh, IBM compatible. Mu music and sound. Neat. <laughs> uh. <laughs> 
Color Computer magazine. magazine. Wow. Jake's memory map. Hot cocoa. Hot cocoa. <laughs> Digitize me. Put me in the matrix. Beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> Hot cocoa. Mission control. Track satellites with your cocoa. Ooh. Cool? Will the NSA be happy to hear about that? <laughs> really? Back in the casino. Casino. <laughs> HJL 57 keyboard. I would love to have one of those. That is such a. I was I was watching a video of somebody taking one of those things apart recently and how he took the caps off and you could see the mechanical springs underneath them and all. So Color Computer Magazine again, huh? That's yeah. like a Superman yeah. dude r ripping his shirt open. And then, um, well, not quite as thick as the rainbow in its heyday, and its heyday, no. but still a good <laughs> magazine. Ah, what oh, is that? Three, three and a half inch floppies? No, it's a three inch cartridge. It's actually different than a three and a half inch Oh, drive. so kind of like a zip drive type deal, huh? Yeah. It was actually on multiple platforms back in the day. And what was the last capacity of those? Uh, was it 600K or 300K or something? It, was, it wasn't not, bad. Not, mm. it, it should say on the ad, but I can't remember the exact number. Uh, Does it say the capacity? It was, I think it was 624K on both drives combined or something. It was some weird number. So not quite as good yeah. as a hard drive, but better than a handful of floppies. May be accessed by manually flipping the media over. Oh, two-sided. Yep. Pretty cool. Neat. And, uh, let's see. I got one other thing here. This here is a uh, old-fashioned cover for I have a whole bunch of printouts of my um, Color Computer Club newsletter. Oh, wow. I would love to see some of the scans of those. And some of the, you know, they all went through the mail. They came, I made them, sent them out, and they came through the mail, and then you can see it the stamp on They were folded in half. We had all kinds of... Um, graphics on them. Yeah, Graphic that's really fancy. By the color computer. There's uh, some that I didn't do myself. And uh, others, uh, other people. Some were just text, text, text. Some were plain back in the old days. They didn't have uh, Yeah, yeah. Going on. Which but is kind of how the rainbow started. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of squawk right now. I'm not sure who's got noise feeding back to us, but I hear a heck of a lot of squawk on the call right now. I'm hearing it too. I guess anybody who doesn't need to be speaking right now, maybe try to mute yourself so we can get, unless Ron's the source, which we'd find out. I saw you put this on Facebook too. What is this Star Trek thing? <laughs> yeah. Play, play it again. Working. Working. <laughs> <laughs> It's a Star Trek noise. <laughs> it's uh, got an OS9 um, controller in it. Computers away. It sounds like the Nick Marentis' game. <laughs> I don't want to brag, but I have got something similar that came with a Beavis and Butthead book. <laughs> you can press different buttons and hear different recordings as you flip through the pages. <laughs> That's cool. Six of these babies. Alphabet Zoo. That was Spinnaker Software. Yeah, they were very popular of educational stuff back in the day, huh? Face Maker was another one they had. A few others. And how many of you guys have this uh, printer book? Hold on, hold it steady for a second so the camera can focus. How to use your Radio Shack printers? Well, I would imagine you turn them on. You put paper in them. Make sure there's a ribbon. Um, connect the cable to your computer. It and had a list of, list of printers that uh, it went through. It, it was pretty helpful. It had all kinds of uh, information and programs in there. <laughs> <laughs> I found this finally. I would look for this. The stereo music synthesizer, the Orchestra 90 uh, yeah. manual. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, I know a lot of people are making Orchestra 90 clones, which is cloning the hardware of the DAX, but is, are those who are doing that, are they also cloning the ROM 
that allows it to play the files and everything and has that built-in William Tell and everything? Does anybody know? Because I've never seen an Orchestra 90 clone myself. Another thing that we used to do all the time was um, print out and put in a folder like this. Um, this is Telewriter 64. All the commands for it. Okay. So There's, that was uh, like, like a reference? A, with it. a reference it. guide? Yeah. yeah. Telewriter 64. I got a bunch of those. That's about it for now, guys. Um, That's if you cool. Go, uh, to my uh, Ron's garage, I have a whole bunch of stuff listed there that I found. Uh, some of it's repeats of what I just showed. Some of it is also um, other stuff. Okay, I will pull up the page and um, uh, where the heck is Ron's garage right now? I'll pull it up and I'll put a link to that in the. Uh, here, I'll do it from my laptop. Okay, all right. Cool, cool. Let me look for that, and I'll copy and paste that in the chat. Okay. All right, cool. Very thanks, cool. Man. Yes, no, thanks for sharing that with us, Ron. Yep. Um, I'm going to post a link to Ron's Garage page uh, in the YouTube chat, and there's also a link to that on the Coco Links page of amacoconut.com. So if you ever need that for a resource, there's a link to Ron's Garage as well as to the OS9 group, too. Uh, very, very cool. Thank you, Ron. Sure. All right. Love it. Good stuff. All right. So let me get back to something I don't think I did earlier in the show. So let me switch over where you guys can see what's going on full screen. And then, Grant, did you have a newbie question for us this week? Uh, yes, I do. And I promise okay. I won't put you on the spot today. That's quite all right. That's, I've recovered from last time. It's easier to recover from you than it is from David Ladd. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's quite all right. So. <laughs> Um, so let's look at this. What, what are some of the views? So yeah, I've been doing a lot of random before, during, and after hurricane views. So um, uh, the live stream that I did on Sunday, which was during the hurricane, up until the time when I lost power, that's gotten 793 views. However, YouTube and their infinite wisdom of finding ways to screw people over copyrights has dinged me for the fact that the Pac-Man Fever song uh, played during that. Now, I've gotten permission from Jerry Buckner to play Pac-Man Fever, but apparently the people who made that music video now have their own copyright to the song, and so they're dinging me. So now that video has also become unviewable, much like the one I did with the, um, with the cowbell when I had that scene from Saturday Night Live with the... Um, that thing so that's been taken down again so this is the second time in a row i've had a video <laughs> taken down by youtube i gotta really be crazy be careful with um things I we're gonna have to start now. calling you the, the infamous stevie stroke yeah so um last week's coco talk from saturday which was episode 25 has gotten 143 views so far which is not bad um uh, when I was driving the night before the hurricane, that video has gotten five. One of them's gotten 500 views. The other one's gotten 323 views. So, yeah, people were really curious to see what was going on with the hurricane. The video I dropped last week of Nick Marentis's, um that segment of Oz K Fest, which also appeared on Coca Talk, that solo video has gotten 100 views, and episode 24 has gotten 180 views. And the infamous floppy talk is now almost at 200 views, 199 views right there so um yeah so coco talk still doing pretty strong 150 to to 200 views per week um i got a comment recently on a very old video i did um, when i first started doing coco games i threw together a little video that was called an introduction to the color computer that was basically um trying to tell people what a coco was before i knew that people already knew that by the way it looks like somebody's trying to call an old group call that's not going to work whoever's trying to call in right now you need to call me directly but this person named kevin goebel said fond memories of my trs-80 tron came to get me right after the movie came out i was writing a program and the screen printed tron 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 and, uh, and i thought that tron was coming for me because the movie just came out and i was 13 i didn't know that it was trace on for <laughs> whatever, I guess you gave my CPU a stroke. That's kind of funny, right? So, um, yeah, so uh, of uh, different people um, commenting on some of those videos there. Uh, on one of the videos I did on Donkey King, somebody says, outstanding version along with Time Bandit, my favorite Coco game. It's this person here, Temmie9, basically saying that Donkey King and, and um, 
and Time Bandit were some of his favorite uh, games. Drencore, our friend Paco Otakte, was commenting on last week's video saying, Always good sh a good show, as always. Can't wait to see everyone next time. Um, this one was kind of funny. Um, the, I don't know if you remember doing this, Curtis, but we did a we did a video on on semi graphics, uh, showing yep. off different semi graphics games. And at that time, Nick Morentis was on Skype, but he wasn't on video, so I just had that picture of him. You know that famous picture of Nick standing outside somewhere in Australia. So this guy says, "Who's that guy on the right? He doesn't move very much, does he?" Uh, well, no, because it was a profile picture. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but we're at a hundred, uh, fourteen hundred and eleven downloads on the podcast right now, and I'm episode twenty-five from last week. Will get published later today, hopefully. Um, what are our most popular episodes? Bruce Moore is joining us right now. So our most popular download right now, still holding strong, is Nick Morentis's Pac-Man Update 1.1 is our most listened to podcast right now with 96 downloads. Coming in at number two um, was episode 21 where we announced that that's, that's now climbed the charts. So Ron's retro video, Grant's newbie question, David Tech Corner, that's gotten 73 downloads. Uh, retro innovations come in at number three with 72 downloads a community chat so yeah so some of the other episodes are really starting to get more listens to now for the longest time the most listened to episode was episode one because obviously that was the first one that was posted but we're now finding that some of the newer episodes are getting um, some good download counts on their own so pretty cool stuff it's just i i like to try to acknowledge when people are um you know, we're are commenting on this thing, giving us feedback. And so Bruce Moore has joined us. Jacob Moore has joined hey, us. Hey, you got your Coco 3 yet? How are you guys doing? We're doing good. Yeah, good to see you. We got the bouncy ball in the background there. We got Sockmaster's Boink demo running in the background. Um, and uh, welcome to the show, guys. What's new and what's going on in Canada, eh? Uh, no, no hurricanes, no storms. No, that's <laughs> <laughs> Not even snow yet. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah, no snow yet. Yeah, Alberta okay. got some though. I saw. Crazy, crazy. Yeah. How's uh, Forest of Doom coming along? Well, you know, it's uh, I was playing it yesterday, and um, it has three levels of difficulty, and I was playing it on the nightmare level, uh, testing gameplay, and uh, and and I died, but but everything's looking everything's looking good there. Just I, just a tiny little gameplay tweak, and uh, I don't know. I I think it's good to go. So I. I'm just putting all my commercials together to be ready for launch day, I think. Okay. Have you got an official launch day yet? Well, I just said November, so I, I don't know. Probably I'll, well, if it's okay, I'll probably launch it on the first Saturday, uh, the first Coco Talk of November, probably. Okay. okay. You know, barring, barring some strange, you know, mishap with my code in the meantime, but yeah. Right, right, right. right. That would be awesome. Yeah. That would definitely be awesome. What is your preferred platform of distribution for this? Paper. Paper. Okay, so buy the make book. Make us type it in. <laughs> buy the book, get the game free. Huh? Yeah, I, in the book, in the book, there is a uh, there'll be a download link. So okay. yeah, you type you type that in, and I'm including a, a soundtrack you're supposed to put on your favorite music player and have ah. music in the background while you're playing. So. Now, is this original compositions? Yep, it is, yep. Ah, that's cool. So that's value added right there. Yeah, well, you hear bits of it in, in my commercial. You hear yes, that? yeah, so yeah, definitely. That is from the soundtrack, yeah. Okay. You, you should actually, we were talking about this earlier, about hooking up MP3 players up to the cassette port and then turning audio on. You should actually have that as an option, have the sound coming through the Coco itself. Uh, well, if we could figure out how to do that, that'd be cool. You know, the other thing that occurred to me is like, you know, there are a few people using DriveWire. Could I tell DriveWire to place? I, you know, I don't know. Yeah, you well, can tell DriveWire to play MIDI stuff, I know. The okay. other thing, too, is at some point in time, and I know your development is locked right now, but, you know, Ed Snyder has all these media players for the Coco SDC. Yeah, you could yes. make it a freaking media file and stream that, you know? Well, if, if, if him and Curtis can, can get together a, uh, an OS 9, uh, some code that'll do the streaming, because I, I, I hope to do my next, my next project using basic 09. Oh, wow. Then, uh, then maybe, yeah, maybe we could definitely have, like, like, I would love to have some sort of video or at least audio cutscene thing going on. And like, the, the possibilities are huge. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, Nick Marionettes, Nick Marionettes would be very happy to hear that's coming through in OS nine. So I'm sure he did that last weekend. He's a good friend of mine. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let him know about it. I think he's already finished up his game Fun Star, and he's working on the uh, the next project. So oh, good. Good. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, Nick. Uh, Nick's birthday was the other day, and I sent him a little message in Skype saying Happy Birthday. He says he's in the middle of selling his house. So Ooh. he's selling his house and they're moving into a new house. So he's been a little bit preoccupied. So he hasn't had time to do Coco activities um, as of late. So hopefully we'll have Nick back in the near future. Um, we haven't had Rick Adams on in a little bit too. So hopefully we'll get Rick back in here. Although we've been hearing from Rick in the Skype chat and we're seeing pictures of what his display that he's working on for Tandy Assembly. But yeah. It's, uh, this is now two weeks in a row that we haven't had Nick Marentis on, on and, and the show is definitely suffering from the lack of an Australian accent right now. Could you, uh, Bruce, by any chance, could you possibly summon and channel in Nick Marionettes for us and maybe we can hear him speak through you so we can at least have a taste of Australia on this episode? <laughs> Good day, mate. Oh, it's nine forever. <laughs> Let me hear you say, ease of use. Ease of use. <laughs> Don't even need the manual. <laughs> That's right. That was awesome. Oh, he is, uh, his spirit is with us. Nick Marionettes will live on forever. So. You know, I, I, think, I think Nick Marionettes may actually phone into one of these Cocoa Talks at some point. Okay. okay. That may Maybe actually we'll, happen, yeah. Another live uh, remote correspondence call or something, huh? <laughs> that would be awesome. Very cool. So, so hopefully November, which is right around the corner, we're we are halfway to October, which means we're close to Tandy assembly, and um, and then uh, we lead into November, which now not only do we have a month of not shaving for those who follow the Movember, the No Shave November, but we'll also have uh, a very shaggy release of Force of Doom, hopefully in November as well. So that'd be awesome. Yeah. Very cool. What's going on, Jacob? Cool shirt there, dude. Oh, thank you. Oh, what do you what got you, there, Jacob? What do you got there? Hey, <laughs> it's Nick Marionettes. <laughs> you, 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 you ought to autograph that and put that on eBay to the highest bidder. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> autograph picture of Nick Marionettes, uh, greatest fan of OS9. Do you by any chance have any pictures of Bill Noble and Curtis uh, Boiled by any chance, too? Oh. <laughs> 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 Those are good. Norlander uh, says he's got to go. I don't know if I already missed you, Norlander, but thanks for thanks for stopping by the live stream today. Nick Marionettes. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Um, yeah, between that and the uh, OS9 Easter egg, we have we have iconic moments that have come from the show. Speaking of some iconic stuff, while you guys are trying to figure that out, I do want to show you one other video here. This was one of the videos that our friend um, Antonio made for us. So now, how do, how do I get back to my? I did I did do a bookmark of this, right? I did this because uh, last time it took me ten years to find it. Here it is. So uh, I'm gonna pull this up for you just a second. Let me switch this back. Let me go back to full screen. Um, but friend of the show, and this guy lives in Florida too. He messaged me on Facebook, and he lives in Florida. But yeah, somehow he says he can't join Coco Talk because, you know, it's apparently 2 o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday is an inconvenient time for somebody. So, you know, go figure. But yeah, but now I'm just giving you a hard time there, Antonio. But yeah, this is a very cool thing that he made. This is the one, He did a Dancing Devil for us not too long ago. And now this is an improved version of the Dancing Devil that he recently posted to Facebook. So everybody enjoy a peek at this here. This is Coco Talk, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer, with your host, Mr. Gameplay Goodness himself, Stevie Straub. <laughs> that is like awesome. A, it's a bobblehead on crack is what it looks like. <laughs> Almost looks like Bill Gates with a suntan. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> so that's cool. I like his artwork. He's uh, he's gonna give Ron Delvo a run for his money here with all the cool little artwork that he's making here. Uh, that's a re really cool design, Coco and CM8 and um, and everything else, right? So um, cool stuff. Thank you, Antonio Carlos Jimenez uh, Ely. Uh, so thanks for making that. That's very cool. We have got some really talented people in our community that make some pretty cool stuff. So that was cool. And to we, see. then we have people like you and me. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Uh, <laughs> so Steve, I have a question. Yes, Bruce. It's not Bruce. It's Wayne. <laughs> oh, Wayne. Hello. Anyway, Sorry. Sorry, Wayne. Uh, yeah. Have you ever been able to get that uh, Loops demo program I sent you onto your Coco? Which demo? The Loops. I don't remember you sending it to me. I'm having a brain freeze right now. It was a basic 09 source code file, and you asked me how to get it onto your Coco? Mm, okay. Well, then I would have to say no. The answer would be no. Uh, uh, obviously, because you don't even remember it. But yes, okay. yeah, I'm, I'm starting to have a flashback, but yeah, I apologize. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Uh, no, if uh, if I you'd don't... like to see it, I can screen share it. Yeah, please, please. Okay. We'll go full screen. Or I can try. Okay. I haven't done screen share before, so. Okay. Bear with me. <laughs> We're, we are bearing. There we go. Okay. We probably need to minimize okay, that. Okay, I don't know what you're seeing, but. Uh, I see the Skype window that says OG Stevie Stroh right now. I think you need to okay. minimize that. Okay, then let's see. Oh, she click on share desktop now, right? Okay, yeah. there you go. Okay. Can you see this window? Proce procedural with loops, the yes. white text on a black background? Yes, we see it. Okay, that's the source code to the program. Okay, procedural uh, loops. Yeah, I wrote this this way to give you an example of how loops are done in BASIC 09. Ah. And it was... Basically, based on the fact of the standard issue go-to loop uh, that most people write in RS-DOS or other basics that require line numbers on every line. Okay. And since go-to is actually pretty well frowned upon in most instances of programming, uh, BASIC-09 has the strength of the, giving you multiple ways of doing loops so that you don't have to resort to go to loops. Okay. So I included a repeat loop, or it's commonly called a repeat until loop. Okay. I gave you a while loop, which is also called a while end while or while do end while loop. And then I gave you a loop loop, which is basically it's just a loop end loop construct that loops endlessly, and the only way to get out is through the exit if end exit statements. Then I decided to go a little further because I wanted you to see how an if then loop would work. Okay. okay. So and it's using the if if then line number statement so that you could loop back and you could uh, check for a key press so you can break out of it. There are some cases in uh, OS nine where you get going in a loop, and the break key doesn't work, and the escape key doesn't work, control C doesn't work, control Q doesn't work, nothing works. You're stuck in the loop, and the only way out is to hit the reset button. Okay. Which I never liked. <laughs> okay. So these, uh, all of these loop examples give you the ability to break out of the loop by checking for a key press using the in key subroutine. Okay. Okay. Then after that, I decided I wanted to give you an example of the use of data statements. You'll notice at the very bottom, there's three data statements. The second mm -hmm. one has a line number. Okay. You go up to this repeat loop up here. It starts out with a restore, which sets the data pointer to that data statement, and the pointer gets set right there. That's mm -hmm. where it looks first. Okay, then it reads through the loop and gets each string, which is each one of these different things, until it gets to the one that says level 1. And then it does a restore 30, which puts the data statement there. What it does, in effect, is it 
reads this and this and this and skips this and this. Right, and it goes to the next one, which then so it's going to say yeah, OS, to OS 9 level 1 rocks is what you're going to get from your yeah. output there. Yeah. All right, yeah. so then I did a second run through it where it just got every one of them so you could see that it would print them all out. Okay, so with OS so, 9, if you want to use, I want to know, but basic O9, if you want to use a line number, you just put that line number in the front of that. But um, it's kind of like a child parent relationship where the following statements don't necessarily have to have line numbers if you don't need to refer to them specifically. Exactly. Yes. And the line okay. numbers are actually labels. Labels. Because they are branch locations. Okay, so uh, if you, if you it, didn't want that to be 20, you could call it. Uh, data or maybe not well, data. Well, no, that's, that's the difference right. with basic 09. Mm. While it is basically a label, mm -hmm. you're restricted to using numbers. Okay, so you still are numeric labels. So it's not yeah. like. Um, yeah, you can make it any number you want. I could have made this one, for example, uh, 2 or 200. And, and so it's not, it's not like a linear sequence in this case of an actual code line number like a normal basic. It, it, is, it is literally just a label. So if you label things in a yeah, non-sequential order, they'll still uh, show up that way. Well, and again, due to the restriction of numbers, if, for example, if I made this 2, this uh -huh. could still stay 30. But yeah. line number 10 would be moved after it. So I oh, would have so to it remember does. line it, number it, 10 to 1. It does mentally reorder the things. Yeah, it does keep the numerical order going. Oh, it does. They're okay. not actual line numbers. They're just labels. They're labels, but it's they will get they sorted. It's just hard-coded it to be numbers. Okay, okay. Yeah, and that, that's, now that's only if it's in, within the same uh, procedure. Oh, that's, uh, uh, Nick, that's Nick Marionette's Yeah, that's in. local to the procedure. Local to the you procedure. You can have another procedure in the data space that also has a line number 10 and a line number 20. Because it's separate. Each procedure is self-contained. Yeah, the procedures I, are actually I named. Code. I love this code because it says OS9 rocks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about the ease of use? Do you like the ease of use of this, Nick? Well, you know, ease of use, is, as long as you don't have too many line numbers, I think you're just fine. <laughs> well, and that is the whole point. The idea is to only use line numbers when you really need them. Okay. Right? And they are basically, they're only needed in branch situations. So you're either uh, go subbing to a line number or you're go toing a line number. Okay. Right? And the only real instance of go to in this code is the if then line number. It's basically saying if the key press is null, then go to 10. Okay. Right? Okay. But uh, you don't use the word go to in that instance. Yeah. Right. And I purposely left out a, an example of go to because you already know how to use that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that was the basic idea was to show you the uh, use of line numbers in Basic 09 as compared to RS DOS or any other basic. Okay. And uh, also to give you an idea of how to do uh, checks for string for key presses on your keyboard so that you don't get stuck in a loop. Gotcha. Um, uh, Nick Marionettes and or Bruce Morris, any of this useful to you or is this knowledge that you guys already possess? Uh, well, I mean, this this whole structured looping business, it's it's a part of structured code. So it's very, uh, uh, if you're going to get into basic 09 programming, this really is the way to go. Um, using the line numbers so far, the way I've seen it used is only if you're using, um, uh, I think you're doing error trapping. I think you're required to use it. Yeah, so on error, error go -to. trap, you have to use yeah, a go-to. Yeah, because it's a go-to. Yeah, it's on right. error go-to. Right. If you so use on error by itself, it resets the error system. Yeah, that's so right. So it's on error to reset it, on error go-to, specific line number to go to a particular place in the code if an error gets encountered. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, anyway, so I wanted to show you how it runs. So I've got VCC running here. Uh, I, I wanted to show you a couple of things, as a matter of fact. Let me go back here a minute and go to the file properties. If you get a chance, if you could ever get this onto a disk image and send it to me that way, then I can load it in, I think. You'll notice that the uh, number of characters is 975 
the file size is 1060. Okay. Now, when you load it into BASIC 09, you'll notice that it's 705 bytes. Wow. And it's because the source code is not loaded as source code. Okay, as things opposed get tokenized. to BASIC, where the entire file is being loaded and it's being stepped through one character at a time. BASIC 09 pre compiles the code. Okay. So instead of seeing, for example, let me edit into it. This first line here, dim key press string one, mm -hmm. is not stored that way. The dim statement has a token, key press is a variable and has its own identifier, and string one has a token. Okay. So it's stored that way, and then when you see the source code statement, it's basic 09 decompiling the statement and recreating your source code. Mm. Okay, That's what it does. Speed. So when you do a list, Speed. Uh, here it's list all. It's actually decompiling every line as it goes through it. Okay. Interesting. So, Bruce, right. are you trying this to number say over here is how much data space the program uses in memory. The data size of fifty seven? Yeah. That's how much how many bytes of memory are used for data. Okay. And very seven hundred and five yeah. bytes are used for the procedure. Okay. So then when you run it, it'll keep going through that first loop until you press a key. Mm -hmm. okay. Then I press another key to get out of that wow. loop, loop, another key to get out of that loop, yeah, another key through. to get out of that loop, and then it goes through the data statements. So that's how loops work in BASIC 09 compared to how they work in BASIC. Okay. okay. And that you can do seems... actually a lot more with them this way, I believe. Yeah, it seems somewhat intuitive. That was I'm what I loved about Basic 09. It it was easier for me to get through than it was to try to get through RSDOS. Right. Well, there's actually three words we use, and I can I hear them right now in Nick Marinette's voice. But ease of use. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's anyway, cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that with us. I just wanted to show you that because I still don't have a way to send you anything that you could physically load onto your com color computer. Well, if you can make so, it into a disk image, this is a .dsk file. Uh, I can if, do that. I Well, actually, this is uh, uh, the, so the, yeah, the uh, extension for OS9 disks is not DSK. It's OS9. Mm. So or at least that, I don't know. That's the extension I've been using, but I do know that OS 9 seems to, or at least the uh, MESS emulator, seem to have a problem with trying to load OS 9 disks if they weren't .OS 9. So okay. I just uh, kept doing it that way because it made it easier to tell the difference between a RS DOS disk and an sure. OS 9 disk. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. So, but I can, yeah, I can make a, a disk, a image and send it to you yeah, that that's easy okay yeah i'd like to try that i'd like to play with that at some point in time oh, yeah. um yeah one of the things i had very very little spare time this week but i did um type in a handful of demos from one of the most recent chapters in the basic book i was hoping to get another video cranked out this week but it just wasn't in the cards but yeah i am very determined to finish that series. That's been a project that I've been that's been lingering uh, with me for a while that I want to get back to and finish. Oh, who is this? Who do we have on the screen here now? Ah, oh, there is Nick Marionettes right there with us live. Hey, Nick, how are you? Good to see you. Big hey, fan mate. Of, big fan of your work. <laughs> Looking forward to Fun Star Two. Fun Star. <laughs> on ROM cartridge. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, Grant Leedy, are you almost ready for your newbie question of the week? Yes, I am, and I'll be very, very easy on you today. Okay, well, we're going to do a quick commercial, and we'll come back, and I will introduce you properly. So we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Coco Talk Live. Hey, everybody. This is Bill Noble. 
co-author of Nitrous Nine. You are listening to Coco Talk Live, the leading live Coco Talk show. Tandy Assembly would like to thank our sponsor, Coco Talk. Coco Talk is the nation's leading live talk show about the Tandy color computer, airing live each week on YouTube with video and audio replays available. Join Coco Talk to discuss community projects, hardware and software, interviews, reviews, demos, and tutorials. For more details about Coco Talk, visit cocotalk.live. Thank you to Coco Talk for being a Tandy Assembly sponsor. You've been hearing all the buzz about Tandy Assembly. All Radio Shack and Tandy computer models under one roof. It's happening October 7th and 8th in Chillicothe, Ohio. Don't miss our guest speakers, including Don French of TRS-80 fame, game designer Lance Nicholas, and Scott Adams of Adventure International. Make your reservations today. Call 800-542-7919 and ask for the special room rate for Tandy Assembly. But hurry, the rates are only good through September 5th. Tandy Assembly. Some assembly is required. Hi, I'm Mike Rowan, one of the organizers of Tandy Assembly. We look forward to seeing everyone in Chillicothe, Ohio. I wanted to take a moment to talk to you about one of the great events at Tandy Assembly. That's the No Minimum Bid Auction. First, all of the auction items are donated. All proceeds from the auction will go toward the cost of the event. The auction is a great opportunity to get some big bargains on unusual vintage computer items. It's also a great deal of fun to see people, sometimes best friends, trying to outbid each other. We certainly hope you'll join in the fun at Tandy Assembly. As I said before, all of the auction items are donated. If you have any items or duplicates in your collection that you are willing to donate to the auction, we would certainly appreciate your donations. Just bring them to Tandy Assembly or contact us through our webpage, www.tandyassembly.com. Thanks, and we look forward to a great time with everyone at Tandy Assembly. All right, it's time for Newbie Talk with the Newbie Question of the Week with your man and my homie, Mr. Grant Leedy. Take it away, Grant. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. I tell you what, the production value on this show continues to go through the roof. (laughs) (laughs) And by roof, we mean floor. (laughs) (laughs) So what do you got for this week, Grant? I got an easy question for you guys today. Um, So basically, you know, if you were just not getting into this hobby and you want to buy the actual hardware... Where do you guys normally get it at? Do you guys more, more or less get it off of eBay, or do you guys wait to uh, go to Coco Fest? Uh, so, where, where's the best place to get this, these uh, these equipment? I'll let you guys all chime in on your own individual opinions on that. Craigslist, eBay. I cheated and bought it all back in the day and just kept it. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's and that's I assume you're not talking about new stuff like the Coco SDC and the you know that sort of stuff you can buy from the uh, usual sources who make them. Yeah, that's correct. More or less like the uh, retro stuff. Is there anything you guys would suggest for uh, people on eBay to avoid? Any bad uh, stories, or do you guys get anything, or did it uh, work? I always recommend price shopping. Go around and look. If you're interested in Coco 2 with 64K, you know, go out and look at all of them. I mean, I've seen some that start out as high as 80 or $90 and some that start out at 20 or $30. You know, and the couple that I've gotten are right around $50. So. Yeah, Michael Newman in the live chat saying uh, his, his method is eBay mainly, although I still have my Coco 1 and my original stuff from back in the day. Yeah, I started on eBay. Um, I made some eBay rookie mistakes when I first started, not knowing um, certain things. So I ended up bidding on three Cocos at the same time, hoping I would get one of them. And I ended up winning all three bids. And so the first time I bought a Coco 2, I got three of them. <laughs> so, we just call uh, those backups, Steve. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. What you know, I, recently I have taken a lot of my surplus and released it back into the community at very reasonable prices. So um, your best bet is to is to have something like that where if it's somebody from the Facebook group or from the mailing list that says, hey, I've got a machine, at least you know it's from a trusted source and you can even see a picture of it working um, and hopefully a reasonable price. Um, eBay's hit or miss. Uh, I have bought probably a dozen Cocos on eBay and maybe only one or two of them have had minor issues. Um, you know, and most of the people who have them don't know how to test them. Most people don't even know that that's not a composite output. It's an RF output. So they don't have, they don't know how to connect it to a TV to see if it even turns on, you know? Um, but what I've seen, and you guys have seen that video where my Coco 3 stopped working and I just had to reseat the RAM chips. The machines are almost bulletproof. You know, they're pretty resilient machines. Um... So I would say the odds are buying one on eBay, you've got a very strong likelihood of of it working. And if it doesn't, then you have people like Richard Lorbieski who know how to fix them. And you've got Mark uh, Marlette from Cloud9. There's a handful of people in the community who know how to work on them. Um, where's your best deal going to be so far that I've seen? It's it's the no minimum bid auctions at, at Coco Fest. So if you can make it there, that's where you're going to get your best deals, hands down. Um, I think enough time has gone by. I'm going to tell you guys what I got that TDP 100 for at last year's Coco Fest. Remember when I got Steve Noskowitz was there and yep. he had a table full of stuff? So I was one of the first people who saw him and I saw the TDP 100 and I go, man, that's great. What do you want for it? And he goes, uh, would you give me 20 bucks for it? I'm like, hell yeah, I'll give you 20 bucks for it. I literally gave the guy 20 bucks and I got a TDP 100 and it, I, and I grabbed it cause I knew I could fit it in my suitcase. So, um, that's a steal. You know, I still remember that CM eight monitor that walked out of there for, was it $40 or whatever it was, even if it was $80, it's, it was a steal. So, um, the prices at the auction are the best prices. Uh, and so I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this year at Tandy Assembly there will be something similar. And I am driving to Tandy Assembly fully intending to hopefully get something at the auction and come back, um, you know, with some spoils of the show, you know. Hey, Steve. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, one more thing on eBay on Facebook uh, Group. You're breaking up. Uh, you're, 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 Mark. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, there's a guy on the Facebook group, Carlos Camacho. Yeah, Carlos Camacho, yeah. 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 Anyway, so he uh, fixes up uh, various Coco 1 and Coco 2s and puts them up on eBay. So he lists, uh, usually gives links to his auction. So if you want to yeah. buy somebody, you know you're going to get a good you know, a good working unit and uh, a warranty, from what I understand, uh, then... Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a trusted member of the community. He was at Coco Fest this year. We met Carlos. He had the dragon shirt. I got when when we put up the pictures of the photo album. I got a picture of me standing next to him. He was wearing a dragon shirt. Um, Carlos Camacho. Yeah, so he does that. He he's done a couple of unique ones too, where he did the Darth Vader Coco, where he spray painted the whole thing black and put that out there. Um, yeah. He did a thing that I don't know if it was the catalyst for a Coco Crew discussion. Like, what's the benefit of putting a sixty three oh nine in a Coco 1 or 2, but that's one of the things that he mentions too, is that when I do it, I'm going to go ahead and put a 6309 in there, which is a faster chip. And somebody's, and, and that was a, that was a host discussion. Like what's the benefit? What's the advantage of having a 6309 in a Coco 1 or 2? And, um, you know, maybe you guys can chime in on that. The only thing that I can think of is that we know it runs cooler, right? So your Coco might run a little cooler. You, you can use all the functions. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Curtis. As I was just say, running cooler means your your gear is going to last longer. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. What I was going to say is that there's no reason you can't use old six or nine software on a Coco one and two either. You get the same advantages as you would on the Coco three. All the extra instructions still work. Your TFMs, your and hardware divides, etc. So you could write software for it. And I think there's a few patches that David and I have snuck into the level one Nitrous nine now that is actually six or nine optimized as well. Hmm. Interesting. And so, you can also get the 6309s cheap. Yeah, and they're more available, I guess, right now, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, there, I, I, I'm actually thinking once I get out of my rush season, if, it, if the darn thing ever ends, that uh, I might take some of the older Coco 1 and 2 games that are a little bit slow mm -hmm. and uh, see if I can actually patch them with a couple of 6309 instructions and see if we can speed them up. That would be kind of cool. That's an interesting project. 
And the the benefit there too is that most of the Coco One and and Twos, the CPU was already socketed, so it's yes. an easy replacement. Unlike a Coco Three, where you literally have to desolder the CPU and put in a socket, which is not within the skill set of the average civilian, you know. Um, so a Coco One or Two, it's a very easy thing to do. Um, there's no downside to it. It, it, it. None of the software that none of the old legacy software is aware of the chip and would take advantage of the chip automatically. <laughs> but like Curtis is saying, that you could possibly, uh, you know, patch something to take advantage of it. And if nothing else, if you get no speed benefit, a reduction in heat of your machine, which lowers the internal temperature, extends the life of that machine. Um, I'll never forget one of the things that Richard asked me to do when we put the RAM in there. He's like, all right, now do this. Pick it up and drop it. <laughs> Give it the drop test, you know? And I literally just picked up my Coco 3 and like a, a, you know, a couple inches off the ground and just dropped it on the freaking table and boom, and it, it didn't skip a beat. The cursor was still blinking, you know? So it didn't even lock up the machine. So the things are built like Sherman tanks, you know? <laughs> and actually that idea is stolen from the Apple 3 because that's actually what techs used to tell people when it started overheating because the RAM would start popping out of the sockets from the heat. And oh, that yeah. was literally what they told you on the phone was you'll pick it up and drop it on the table and it would reseat them back down and they would work. Kind of like yeah. loose teeth that might just go flying. <laughs> yeah, Tandy, Tandy actually had the drop test, uh, w at least for the Model 3s when I was at uh, Tandy Computer Assembly. We would, they would actually lift them up about two inches off the ground and drop them. Yeah. Just to make sure that they still worked. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I had no reason to doubt you, and I did. I, I suspected it was a fairly safe thing to do, anyways. But I figured I was in good hands between you and Sockmaster with their, with your <laughs> wisdom. So, <laughs> but hey, I was uh, playing. Steve Bruce here. Yeah. Just back to the to the newbie question of where to get hardware. I, I wonder if someday we'll be getting down to the point where we actually buy broken machines and get them repaired. If that's all we're going to have left, that that actually ended up being a choice I had to make. <clears throat> I had a broken machine. It's like, do I get a new one off of eBay or do I repair it? And in the end, the repair was not only cheaper, but then I got the 6309. I got the cooler running bits put into it. So I wonder if it'd be worth, you know, just kind of picking up a, you know, a broken cocoa and just getting it repaired and, you know, a few bucks and away we go. Yeah, I actually have gotten a couple of good deals off of uh, eBay where there were broken, you know, as-is uh, Cocos. And, of course, I can fix those and I can right. uh, scavenge parts off of them, too. So it's yes. a good, good deal. Some of the descriptors you'll see, mo the, most, the most common one is untested, where people don't know how to test it. So you're thinking it's a gamble. I think it's a calculated risk. But sometimes you see ones that say uh, sold for parts you know, four parts only where they're assuming it's not working and they're saying, well, yeah, maybe you just need a keyboard or maybe you can use the shell. So there are some systems that are presumed to be not functioning um, and they work. I lucked out with one of the Cocos. I think it's the Coco I sold to you, Grant, um, where I bought a Coco. I took a risk because it said not working or, or untested or not working or something like that. I was buying it hoping I would get an 87 gimme and it was a crapshoot. And so I'm like, well, because I needed an 87 gimme for my um, RGB adapter. So I bought it, I uh, took a risk and I, think, I think I got it for like $100 with shipping. So it was reasonably priced as far as Coco 3s go. Um, and it turns out that the bloody thing worked and it still only had an 86 gimme, not the 87, but it was a working Coco 3 that the guy just didn't know it was working. So, um, Sometimes even the ones that they think they don't work, they might actually work. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Um, I was. Oh, when we're talking about swapping the the CPU, um, the dragons all seem to be socketed as well. So yeah, couple, yeah, like, right. And I think that was part of that discussion. Is there an <clears> advantage <throat> to putting it in a dragon? And you know, again, there's no disadvantage. So even if you don't notice, you're you know, one of the things that Carlos mentions in his description is that you know we're putting in the 6309, which is the high speed chip. And yes, it is a faster chip, but will 99% of Cocoa 1 or 2 software yield any speed gains from this, not without modification. So the chip itself might be faster. You know, it's like putting in a, uh, you know, a hot rod engine, but having that, that you know, how they have the chip that limits the the, C, the horsepower of, uh, of the faster sports cars. It's kind of yeah. like the software has limited the hardware because if it's not meant to unlock it, it it's, you're literally not going to see it or feel it. But... Um, it's it's not a bad thing to have it. 
Yeah, no, those those definitely softer. Like I said, Nitrous Nine has already got some patches, and I think David and I will be going and pursuing that a bit further and adding some more stuff that speed it up. Um, if you have a 64K RAM, you can copy the basic ROMs in and then patch the IRQ routines so that you can kick it into native mode, which will give you 10% to 15% speed up on every basic program above oh, wow. and beyond this, you know, what it normally does. So there's a few things you can do. And then, uh, like I said, if we patch some of the games, like some of the games that might use stack blasting to copy between screens, well, if you change that to a TFM, it, you know, it speeds up by 10,000 cycles of frame or something. So, Wow. Is that a yeah, real? And, and those processors are very cheap. Uh, in China, you can get them through eBay through China, I think, as low as $1.30. And <laughs> I, I also sell them here stateside for three forty nine. And I also, uh, if you want to add a socket to it, you can also include it in the order. And it's a little bit extra, but it comes out to four twenty five. Hey, Richard, while I have you here, you're going to be at Tandy Assembly. Yes. I'm wondering if I can bring two Cocos for you to look at. And I'll explain what the symptoms are. You tell me if it's worth bringing them or if you'll even have time to look at them. But I've got one Coco I bought that we believe is a PIA issue because I've switched out three different keyboards and certain keys don't work. Okay. Um, and I think John Linville said that might be something to do with the PIA. So okay. is, that, is that something that would be easy for you to look at? Uh, yeah, you can always, you know, I, I'd be okay. more than happy to look at them. Now, I've got another Coco 2 that I bought, and the reason why I bought it is because it was in the box. You know, so it's one of these ones that came with the box. It still actually had the plastic around it and everything else. And I think Curtis and I looked at, looked at it together on a Skype call one time, and it looks like it's not reading all 64 of the K. So I'm suspecting that there might be a RAM issue. And I'm not sure if these are socketed RAMs or soldered RAMs, but I didn't bother to open it up. But I didn't know if that's something, too, or maybe... If I bring you one of these Coco 2s, are you able to fix RAM problems? Uh, yes, uh, RAM is easily available. So, I mean, if they're socketed, it's extremely easy. Just swap yeah. them out. To so see. maybe I'll pre-qualify that by looking at uh, looking at it and opening it and determining it if it's socketed RAM or if it's. Um, but it would be just kind of neat to have that one if that it's sitting in a box and it's on a shelf and I'm never going to use it. But it would just be nice to know that all 64 of its K's were fully K-ing, you know what I mean? <laughs> or whatever whatever K's do, I want it to do the full alphabetic capability of the level K, you know? So, um, yeah, so maybe I'll bring those along um, for grins and giggles. All right, Steven, I, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh, I was, uh, yeah, the other thing about Tandy Assembly, yeah, I'll, I'm going to bring uh, my soldering equipment and all that stuff. So if you also want to upgrade, uh, anybody wants to upgrade their CPUs to 6309s, uh, be more than happy to do that as well. Because mm. I'm going to, just a, a hint, I'm going to be selling those processors really cheap. So be prepared. Okay. okay. Yeah, put me down definitely for a, uh, I think, a, a RGB to SCART cable for sure. And I'm sorry, Grant, go ahead. Uh, actually, I have one more question. It's non uh, Coco related, but it is Tandy related. Uh, I am looking for those mm. old magazines that was made by Fultsoft PCM. Does anybody remember that magazine? And if so, do you know if they have been scanned and archived anywhere? I remember the magazine. I don't know if it's been scanned. Hmm. So I don't yeah. know that we have an answer for that right now. Yeah, it wasn't a very popular magazine, but uh, what did PCM stand for? I don't uh, remember. C Curtis, CPM? do you remember? No, PCM. Oh, Paul PC Cher uh Yeah, Paul Ch uh, Charlie Mary. Hmm. Yeah, it was a fairly short-lived one, wasn't that to cover the Tandy One Thousand series? That's correct. It was correct. called Personal Computer Magazine. Uh, okay. And I found this link to Wikipedia. Don't know. Whoops. Boy, it copied a lot there, didn't it? Uh, somebody's asking. Um, Spood fed up says, was that the same company that did Rainbow False Off? Yes. 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 That's a big 10-4. Good, buddy. I don't know if we ever had permissions to get those scanned or not, and if anybody even saved those. I don't know if permissions is even an issue at this point, but. <laughs> okay, here's the Wikipedia link. It'll tell you about the magazine, but I don't know if it'll tell you if it's been scanned or not. I haven't read okay. it. 
Well, another website that's got a lot of things is archive.org. And so if, if it's not on the color computer archive, there are a lot of generic things that are available on archive.org. Yep. Pretty... Yeah, and I've had no luck in finding it there, but... Uh... Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that was that was a host discussion one time on the Coco Crew podcast too. Was you know how do you prefer to consume magazines? Do you like to have the original ones where you can flip through them? Are you okay with reading digital copies of these magazines? And is there a preference? Um, and again, I think a lot of the things it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, for me, when it comes to reading, uh, I, I, nothing for me beats paper. Uh, both in the how it's the ease of strain or lack of strain on my eyes, as well as the convenience of the tactile tactile ability of it to hold it, touch it. Um, I prefer reading off of paper myself. Actually, Steve, I was uh, I think in your case it'd probably be just you get the audio book version. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't like reading manuals. <laughs> yeah. I like I like reading magazines because there's lots of pictures. <laughs> yeah, we'll do it with uh, David's voice. <laughs> David could be the voiceover of the of the uh, books on tape, huh? So. <laughs> a lot cheaper to read it on the computer. I mean, you don't have to buy the magazines. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a benefit to having the the electronic version of it, especially and if you've got like a tablet or a touch device. You can kind of just like use your finger to swipe through the pages and stuff. If it's um, OCR too, you can search through it on the computer, which is really handy. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. are some benefits to that. Um, if you're looking for a particular piece of code buried away in some old archive somewhere, if you can, if it's searchable, man, that makes a big difference. Not bad. Me. Yep. Very much. So, did we help answer any of your questions, Grant? As far as wait, places to get cocos and opinions on. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Not well. Thank you for your questions each week. They give us they give us some legitimate content rather than just listening to all of us <laughs> talk out of our arse for four hours. So, um, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, all right. Well, let's take a quick commercial break and then let's take a look at the Tandy Assembly website when we come back and see what's new and exciting with Tandy Assembly. So we'll be right back. This is Randy Kindig of the Poppy Days Podcast. I just love me some cocoa, and nobody covers it better than Steve Strobridge. You're listening to Coco Talk. This feud between the king and his half-brother, the wizard, has been going on for long before I was around. Presently, the king's scepter has been in the wizard's grasp for over 50 years, and his highness has worked himself into a royal frenzy. At first, he managed to get volunteers to deliver the ransom, promising them great wealth and even a promotion to royal office, but none of them succeeded. I don't know why I decided to go to the public market that day, but there I was, minding my own business, when with a fanfare of trumpets the king arrived, casting his baleful eye about the masses. He fixed his eye on me this time, and now I find myself another unwilling adventurer in the forest of doom. Hey! Oh. Oh my word. There's nothing for it now, lad. It's do or die. All right. Well, that was the second trailer for Forest of Doom, which was a world debut right here on Coco Talk Live. So uh, very cool. We're definitely all looking forward to that. So here's the Tandy Assembly website, which is tandyassembly.com. And for those of you who are not familiar with what Tandy Assembly is, well, it is the first ever vintage computing um, festival event gathering type thing similar to Coco Fest or a VCE, Vintage Computing Festival, or some of these other retro events. But this one is focused entirely on the Radio Shack computer catalog, everything from the 70s through the 90s. And, of course, the TRS-80, the original TRS-80, 
later known as the Model 1, would launch the Model 3, the Model 4 series. Um, later on, obviously, our color computer came out. There were many other TRS-80 systems that would become like the Model 2, the Model 16s, and then there became the Coco 1, the Coco 2, the MC-10, the Coco 3, Tandy 1000. Tandy 1000 went through Tandy uh, 5000s. There was the... Um, uh, what was the uh, what was the the 100 model? It was like a little mini laptop. There were pocket computers. So yeah, there's obviously there's no shortage of machines that Tandy Radio Shack TRS-80 made for um, you know almost 30 years. When the 70s, 80s, 90s, right? So three decades, whatever, two and a half decades. So yeah, a, a long lineage of Tandy. Um, systems were made through the years and there's a lot of people who are loyal to these systems just like we are loyal to the color computer the TRS-80 community is loyal to those hello mr. robot shop how are you he just joined us on the live stream um, so yeah so Tandy assembly is the first ever event that is dedicated to Tandy systems and it's going to be in Chillicothe Ohio October 7th and October 8th Right now, what are the speaker lineups? I believe the keynote speakers are going to probably be locked in and are probably not going to change now. So Rick Adams was the most recent addition to the keynote speakers. So Scott Adams um, of Adventure International, many, many, many um, iconic text adventure games in the 70s and 80s. Um, Don French, who is the creator of the original TR-80 computer, correct? Um, and Lance Mikolas, and what what was what's Lance's claim to fame? I know he made uh, games for TRS-80s. Yeah, he made games for both the Model One, Three, and the Coco. He made a, a really good Star Trek game called Trek Three Times Five that came out back in 1981. It's one of the first 32K games. Oh, neat, 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 neat. And of course, our own beloved Rick Adams wearing his Coco Talk shirt um, is going to be talking about the resurrection of Bomb Threat, which is you. We've kind of. We've been a witness to that story here on Coco Talk as it's as it's been kind of unfolding, and we've seen the, some of the demos and stuff. And so then there are some um, other speakers as well, such as our uh, very own lovely and talented John W. Linville of the Coco Crew Podcast is going to be talking about keeping the Coco in the game. Peter Satinsky of the Trash Talkers Podcast will be talking about the Model Two line. Uh, I will be talking about my journey of doing things like YouTubes and podcasts and, and meeting the communities and some of the projects that I've been inspired to kind of do myself. Uh, Brendan Donahue will be talking about his uh, Coco VGA project and what he's had to do to hack BASIC to let, let BASIC have native support for things like 64 columns and, and extra color registers. Randy Kindig will be talking about TRS-80's Tandy's portable computers through the years and then Arno and Sasha will be talking about an Android-based emulator for um, TRS-80 Model 1 and 3 that will also have an app store. Now, how cool would this be to have something like that for the Coco, where you could just download the Coco emulator and then just have an app store and load Coco games through your um, mobile device? That would be so cool. Um, I mean, we've ha I've had these discussions in the past, and that the biggest hurdle with that is is circulating the ROMs, which are copyrighted originally by Microsoft. So it's kind of hard to do it, but it would be really cool if we could do something like that. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what that is all about. Um, so these are some of our speakers. There are a number of exhibitors. And so there's typically, if this is similar to how Coco Fest was, there was an exhibitor area. And I love how Bruce Moore called it, as it kind of reminded him of like a... Um, an art festival you know it had very much that vibe where you know people were at tables not everything was computer oriented it was very much like a little um, go going to almost like a church bake sale or something you know where you have all these different tables and people have different things on display very cool stuff so so um, uh, I will be exhibiting a real Coco 3 running uh, things like Popstar Pilot and um, Donkey Kong Remix and things like that I might possibly bring the Coco Pie if I can get that thing working have that running on a second screen Mike Rowan will be showing off um, the Tandy Color Computer. Here's our friend Richard Lorbieski of Voice and Tech. Will be I'm not sure what he's showing, but he's also going to be selling cables and doing repairs and all kinds of stuff. Peter Satinsky will be showing off Tandy Xenix, which is uh, Microsoft's version of the Unix operating system. Very cool stuff. Cloud9, who we know and love, Mark Marlette and Sandy Weimer, have all kinds of products, uh, new and old, for sale. Peter Bartlett and Malcolm Ramey. 
Um, we'll be having classic TRS-80s with modern upgrades. That'll be interesting to see. Randy Kindig will be showing off Tandy's portable computers through the years. Retro Innovations, our friend Jim Brain. We'll have Tandy Color Computer and General Systems products. Ian Maverick coming down from Australia, showing off um, his handmade TRS-80 upgrades. There's our friend Brendan again with his Coco VGA. Alan Hightower showing off Tandy 1000 through 5000 series PC compatibles. John Linville with Retro Tinker showing off all kinds of cool wares. Evan Wright in his um, text adventure tool. Scott Adams will be there again. Uh, Mike Michael Brandt, who is going to be carpooling with me as well, and my uh, roommate for the weekend will be having a display of some of his. He's got an impressive retro collection himself. Rick Adams will be showing off Bomb Threat the Game. Cartridges will be available for sale. Brett Gordon will be showing off Fuzix or Fuzix or whatever you want to call it. George Phillips will be showing off TRS-80 video and other demos. And then Paul Fiscarelli, friend of our live streams, Ficecap, will be showing off various um, TRS-80 projects as well. So cool lineup of exhibitors. Uh, I think the um, schedule hasn't changed too much either, so we have our different speakers. So yeah, if you guys want to see this, um, you can go to Tandy Assembly website and see it. One, the thing I do want to mention too is that this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking forward to everything, but Saturday night around 7 p.m. Uh, Ohio time, we're going to do a live version of Coco Talk. Similar to this, we're not going to call it Coco Talk, though. I'm calling it Tandy Talk because everybody who is at Tandy Assembly, we're going to do a live stream. We're going to have the same type of discussions we have now, but right now we're typically doing this all virtually, right? Everybody's in a different city, a different state, a different country. We will all be under one roof and we'll even have a live audience. So that would be kind of interesting to have that dynamic and that chemistry and as well as uh, have the live stream component of it too like we have with coco talk so that i'm really really looking forward to hoping that doesn't suck um Steve, yeah need a graphic for that for that yeah. sure you know anybody who screwed up yeah i was gonna say if you know anybody who does graphics ron <laughs> yes i do yeah, I'll come excellent. I'll put a couple things to shoot them to you. Let me okay. Know. Yeah, Tandy talk. Yeah, so and, uh, I'm looking forward to that. I just posted uh, three picture, uh, three pictures of uh, boxes of uh, monitors I have in boxes. Oh, my, neat. Um, Ron Delvo's garage. Ron Garage. That's cool. I if have you a if, CM8, CM10, and CM11 in the box. Wow. Uh, if you ever want to part with anything, you know you've got some yeah. friends who would love to take some of your hand-me-downs. <laughs> yeah. I need to do bartering. Bartering? Yeah. yeah. I, I'll, I will barter David Ladd for anything that you're willing to give me. I'll even take a dried-up printer ribbon for David Ladd. So. <laughs> I'll put it in my garage. <laughs> Very Do you get a cool. discount if David's still sick? Or? <laughs> yeah, he's not worth as much. We'll pour some food in there. <laughs> so make sure you give him a fresh you know bowl of water and some dry food and change the litter box every so often he'll be fine so <laughs> no serious though david get well soon get well soon david is david even still there or is he just ignoring me yeah i just couldn't be bothered <laughs> <laughs> good man it's one good of his man. best comebacks yet couldn't be bothered. It's got me on the pay no mind list. Okay. So, quite frankly, Steve, you're just not worth the time. <laughs> <laughs> I've been insulted better by worse. So, <laughs> good stuff. Hey, hey uh, Steve, I have a question about your rental car. Who are you renting from? Oh, uh, I don't know. I got to pull up my email. I don't remember. It's probably like Enterprise or something. I have a travel agent that I go through. I know her. Um, and so she, whenever I fly to um, Coco Fest too, she does that. She she books the flights and, the, and everything. I don't book oh, okay. the room through her because I. I'm going um, down for a fashion show down there uh, in case yeah, so. a lady names named um, Sonia coming to the pictures. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's coming. Hold on. Okay, I just hung up on Wayne because he had some background noise. There. Somebody was talking back there. My wife's calling me. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think it might be Enterprise. I don't remember. But um, it, it was. It's. I have the car for five days, and it's a full-size car, and it's costing me like $210. So it's like maybe $30, $35 a day for a big car because there's two of us, and I want room, too, because we're bringing stuff and hopefully bringing stuff back. So I didn't want to do a compact. 
Right, so, yeah, because I, I have a truck and I have limited space. I didn't want to put all my stuff in the back of the truck bed and then, you know, park somewhere overnight and having it ripped off or anything like that. So yeah. I was thinking maybe a car might be a better idea. So Yeah, well, I mean, I can I can forward you an email with um, the, the lady who does everything for me. She looks it up and, gets, and gives me a quote, and if I like it, I say book it, and boom, it's booked. So... Um, yeah, no, I, I, I call back Wayne. You, you started having like a lot of noise of you t- like talking to somebody in the background, so I just hung up on you. So call back in, and I'll put you back on the call. I just had to silence that. Um, yeah, but I'm also like so the expense this year because I'm splitting everything with Michael Brandt. It's it's a little bit easier. So um, you know it's going to cost me two hundred and change for the rental car. It's going to be about three hundred for the three nights in the hotel. So you're looking at now we're already looking at five hundred bucks. But when you cut that in half, it's not as bad. You know, so we're going to share that we're going to share the expenses and share the gas and stuff. So it'll end up costing me a little bit less money than me just flying out to Cocoa Fest by myself. And I now have the the added benefit if I want to buy something at an auction, I can now not have to worry about it. Does will it fit in my suitcase and fit on the plane? You know, I'll actually consider doing that next year for Coco Fest too. If I can, I'm, I'm I'm hoping to build up my day job business to where I don't have to teach night classes anymore. And if I'm able to, do, which I would imagine that should be gone by April of next year. So if I don't have to worry about my night classes and I can take time off, I might do another road trip to. Um, to Coco Fest and because they've got awesome auctions, it's worth it. <laughs> you know, it's worth being in the car two days for all the haul that you can bring back from those auctions. You know, you may so. have to buy a van. <laughs> yeah, I I, I want to go up there because I, I really like to get some Model Two, Model Three stuff, and I'm just very I, I'm scared to have it that stuff shipped. Uh, yeah, it will yeah, wind up yeah. in pieces. Exactly. That's what I hear. Listening to the Trash Talk podcast, they're basically saying if you're ever going to buy any of the model series of computers, it's always best to get local pickup whenever possible because most of the people don't know how to pack them well and most of the transportation companies just don't handle the box as well. So the combination of those two things is not uh, a safe bet on the machine you know well i also know for a fact like on the model threes there there was problems with the standoffs for the uh, monitor and they would break off so oh yeah i forgot who i'm talking to you work for tandy so you know better than anybody (laughs) so yeah (laughs) yeah i i learned by hearing i I learned by listening to smart people so yeah (laughs) but i I can uh, model uh, one to a guy in canada one time and when he got it back, it was uh, broken. And um, showed me pictures, and um, we filed a claim, but it could, never got taken care of because uh, America and um, Canada's mail don't uh, work together. So he was never able to, you know, get any satisfaction out of it. Hmm. I see," said the blind man. All right. Well, we are going on three hours of Coco Talk. Have we beat this episode to death this week? We need to save stuff for next week. We can't talk about everything. So there'd be nothing left to talk about, right? So, <laughs> uh, did we want to? Uh, did we want? Did we have a tech segment in store this week? Did Curtis and or David have anything technical they wanted to talk about this week? I don't think either of us had time or inclination to do so this week. So. I know David's a little under the weather. Um, yeah, and I've no, been swamped. I haven't, I haven't done too much that's technical, and the only issues I've had has just been an actual hardware issue, which will just require a replacement part. So Okay, that was the, uh, the chip on your um, uh, Coco FPGA you were talking about? Yeah, it's just the, the, um, the Max... 3232 chip is bad so Mm -hmm. it's just got to send it back and have ed replace the chip because it's surface mount gotcha i don't do surface mount chips they're a pain in the proverbial rear i prefer the chips with ridges in them so when i put them in the dip they don't break as easily oh god (laughs) oh come on you guys can do surface mount it's easy Easy peasy, easy peasy lemon squeezy. <laughs> Could do that blindfolded with one hand soldered behind my back. <laughs> right. I do dips for a very, very good reason because it's yeah. easy. Then I can yeah. use a socket and I can replace the chip. 
Yeah. I find it's even easier just to hire somebody else to do it. <laughs> I, I, I do surface mount ships all the time, so yeah. The, the ones I hate are the real, real small ones, but I can do those as well. Yeah. All right, well, we have no tech segment, so that's cool. Yeah, and my wife is calling me, so I'm probably going to have to wrap it up. She's got the kids over at a neighbor's house, and i got to see what uh, what she wants, and I was going to complain about something. You know how wives are. So, um. <laughs> well, Before we go, I just wanted to say uh, I, I'm hoping that all the cocoa users in Florida and the area there got through the, the hurricane okay. I know you did. I'm yeah. The others that you know as, did as well. I think Barry Nelson uh, chimed in that he was doing okay, too. He's in Miami. Um, so yeah, that'd be a grant just disappeared and welcome back, Wayne, call, call us back grant. If you accidentally hung up, um, yeah, I, you know, it's still, it's still kind of hard to tell what's going on because, because it's no longer a storm and, you know, the media is only about the sensational part of things. The fact that there's real devastation going on right now, that's not necessarily as newsworthy or news exciting. So I don't see as much coverage as what's going on in the keys because the keys got pummeled. Yes. They were the first ones that were hit. Um, I've seen some pictures of Miami where the streets are actually covered in beach sand. So, like, you can't even see the asphalt of the road because it's been washed over with beach sand. And you can see, like, pictures of, like, street lights and beach sand. And street, it's like a Planet of the Apes scene where you've got technology on the shore, you know. Um, so um, I've seen pictures of, of severe flooding in the Keys. I've seen some stuff like that. Um uh, one of my clients who uh, does real estate, they actually had were starting to set up an office in the Keys. So they've got a place they were leasing down there that is not habitable, and they've met a bunch of families down there whose homes are flooded and not habitable. So they've actually put together a truck. We're asking everybody to donate all their extra supplies. So all of us up here who dodged the bullet, because we all bought canned goods and crackers and all the stuff you buy, um, and so they just basically said, if you've got any extra supplies, give them to us. We're going to load up a truck and we're taking them to the families. We're not giving them to a charity. We're taking them directly to the family. So a lot of us did that and they filled up a huge box truck with food and supplies and clothing and toothbrushes. And, you know, you've got nothing when your whole house is flooded out. You literally have nothing. And those are the areas I know about. I don't even know how the West Coast is doing right now because they got pummeled too. And a lot of stuff is just not making its way to the news because it's no, the same thing of New Orleans. When New Orleans got flooded after the hurricane left, there wasn't a whole lot of footage of the fact that an entire city was underwater because that's not as exciting. It's no longer dramatic. Now it's tragic. Nobody, Everybody likes drama. Nobody likes tragedy. You know. So um, I just wonder what they're going to do with all the garbage because uh, my friend in uh, Texas... His street was filled with litter. I mean, they they had a huge pile in their yard, and their neighbors and their neighbors. And yeah, this goes on forever. And where where do you put all this stuff? Yeah, yeah. These are these are these are you know, these are real world problems that that you know a lot of us are dealing. with. Texas has been underwater since before we got hit, and there's still areas there that are underwater. So, um, yeah, definitely. Um, thanks for mentioning that, Curtis, and our. Um, our thoughts and prayers and, and, and hearts go out to everybody, and we hope, hope everybody's well, and we hope everybody gets back on their feet as soon as possible. Um, not everybody was like me with a camera in the middle of the hurricane live streaming it. So, <laughs> Do you have a uh, gas now? Uh, yeah, we, we're pretty much back to normal here where I'm at, you know. Um, the the biggest challenge... Eating. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> The biggest challenge that we have right now still, and again, these are like first world problems, but the Florida Turnpike, which is the main highway I commute on the most, it's a toll road. And most of the time, it's not as heavily used because most people don't want to pay to use it. But now, right now, because we're still in a state of, of disaster, tolls are lifted. So there is just a thousand times more people on the turnpike right now. So the traffic is very congested. Uh, so because I drive, I take the turnpike to go teach my night classes. And that's usually a 45 minute drive. And it's now taking me an hour to hour and 15 minutes to get to get down there each day because of the traffic. But it's just congestion. Other than that, it's, you know, again, the uh, I can't complain when it comes to that. Um, so where so I'm at you, was, you go ahead, Ron. Ballroom dancing or something? Or uh, I, well, I teach, uh, floppy forensics. Uh, so I get all into the, uh, tracks and sectors and the, um, 
the algorithms of the displacements and the diffusion of the uh, no, but I teach um, IT certifications, so A plus, Network plus, Security plus, Microsoft Server certifications, Cisco stuff like that. I I teach people how to do what I do for a living. So by day I do it, by night I teach it, and then on the weekends we talk about the cocoa. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I mean, I, I'm, most of Florida did well, but there are there are parts who did less well, and so we definitely we pray yeah, for. Know, a I just recovery. know there's a few cocoa owners out there, and I, I've, I've yeah. heard from a few of them. I don't think I've heard from all of them, so I was just wondering right, if you right. had. Not, not other than whatever I'm seeing on Facebook, you know. So uh, I remember Barry Nelson put a posting saying he hopes he comes home to his Cocoa Three when he comes back, and I remember Vince Tran did the same thing. He posted a picture of his big glass case full of his ten thousand Cocoa cartridges. Um, so I believe those guys have all chimed back in that they're they're okay and that their their property is safe. So. Um, and okay. I think Michael Brandt was basically, he, he was working at the hospital, so he was without power for five days, and he was stuck in there because he, um, he does caregiving for people with special needs, you know, so he wasn't able to leave. So our friend Michael Brandt up in the Orlando area was in that hospital that he works for for, I think, about five days without power. So I remember him posting on Facebook when he got back home, and he finally got power at home too. So, um, But I believe he's okay, and I, I, I believe his possessions are okay as well okay yeah good stuff good stuff all right so we want to go ahead and wrap up this week's cocoa talk and we're now into the three hour time frame what is that little baby you're holding up there ron that was inside of this uh, uh star trek thing that I showed. oh in the star trek thing and, and nobody noticed what one guy did after a while he goes what's the little baby doing in there oh, yeah. <laughs> it's something i found you ever find stuff when you get out of your car in a parking lot, you step out and look down, and there's like a smashed uh, Snickers bar, or there's a um, baby doll, in my case. Or, <laughs> uh, you know, a little army man with no gun. Ah, okay. <laughs> the, the, what's that? The, the, uh, what was that thing called? Just the, the, the something of the, the, lost, the toys, the lost toys, or the toys that were forgotten, or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, Sadab just stopped by. My friend from India just came by. Hey, Sadab, how are you? Um, yeah, I occasionally notice odd things. But for a minute when you held it up, I thought it was a uh, David Ladd action figure. Um, so, yeah. Hold that up again because it actually could be. That could be a David Ladd action figure. Let's see. Uh, it very much resembles David Ladd, especially in the atomically correct department down there. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Yeah. Make Someone is going to be extremely hurting after <laughs> next Cocoa Fest. The Island of Misfit Toys is what Michael Newman says that's called. Yeah, the Island of Misfit Toys. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, that did, that did look, look, look like a David Ladd action figure. It was almost to scale, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> uh, we got we to gotta kick him while he's down. David Ladd's not feeling good, so let's kick him while he's down. That's that's the American way. <laughs> Steve, you might not make it back from Chicago next year. <laughs> oh man! All right, guys, we are going to wrap up this week's Coco Talk. For so for those of us who are still in the call, we have Karen Anscombe, his hair, and Grant Leedy, and David Ladd, and his his identical twin action figure. And Mark Overholzer and uh, Bruce uh, Wayne Campbell. I want, I keep calling you Bruce because I think of Bruce Campbell, the famous actor from Army of Darkness. So um, I get that confused. Uh, L. Curtis Boyle and Glenn Hewlett and Richard Lorbieski and Ron Delvaux is here with us. And um, we've had many other people on the call, all of which I've forgotten at this point. Um, but I'm old. Uh, who was with us in the live chat? We had Death Dog 8 Gaming came in here. Michael Newman was here. Richard Cavell was here. Lego versus Minecraft was here. Retro Innovations. Jim Brain was here. Michael Newman. Uh, Norlander was here. Wayne Campbell was here. Uh, Paco Otakte was here. Also known as David Ladd, one of his many personalities. And uh, Sixy. Karen was also posting things in the chat. So was Mark. So was Curtis. Uh, Spoon Fed Up was asking about Fallsoft. He was in the live chat. Sadab from India just shot, just uh, showed up by. Michael Newman again chiming in. 
saying about the Island of Misfit Toys, and then Paco Atake saying, uh, Original Gamer Stevie Stro, you will get yours. Okay, so there we have it. I believe I've addressed everybody. And, okay, three hours. It's time to call this one. Yet. Yeah, <laughs> so it's time to... Time to call this one uh, episode 26 of Coco Talk, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer, also featuring David Ladd. So So um, this is officially the uh, half year anniversary then, right? Half year anniversary? What do you mean? Well, 26 weeks. Oh, that's right. Half a year. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Um, Yeah. Wow. For David, it probably feels like years and years, but... Give him a little Coco. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so don't forget, go to our retro swag shop, which is 8bit256.com. You can get yourself a Coco Talk coffee mug just like this. Look how gorgeous that is. It's nice. It's made out of metal. Um, it was put together with cheap Canadian labor, which you got to love, right? You can get yourself the new deluxe Coco Talk t-shirt. They can't see you, Mark. I'll switch over to show you off in just a second here. So... Mark Overholzer are also showing up the royal blue version of the deluxe Coco Talk shirt. And it's, um, they, this company does a good job with color. You know, you can get this really good multicolor printing. Um, and it lasts a while. My, I, I've been got many washings on the washing and drying, and they seem to last. So good quality. Okay, I guess that was Ron Delvaux waving goodbye, and I guess he's just gone. So Ron has left. Um, a moment of silent meditation for Ron Delvaux. And that's it, guys. So thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. For all things Coco, go to amacoconut.com. Uh, for retro swag, go to 8bit256.com. Um, Cocotalk.live is the site for our show. Uh, we are a podcast. You can listen to previous episodes on Cocotalk.live. And I don't know what else to say. Have I missed anything? Not until next week. Until next week. All right, guys. Everybody say goodbye to everybody. Later. Everybody. Later, all. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. So long. Okay. Thank you all in the live audience. Bye-bye now.